today of May 24th uh, to, to order, please. And without further ado, Commissioner Eggers, would you please lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Invocation first. Invocation first. Yes, I think we better do that first. Reverend, Reverend, Williams. Oh. Reverend Williams is here. Reverend Williams, you're coming up to do the invocation, please. Yes, please come forward. Members of the Aye. commission, I'm glad to see you all back in your chambers. Let us look to God. Father, we're thankful and grateful for your loving kindness, for your tender mercy. Thank you for the wonderful and great nation that we live in. Thank you for free speech, elected government. We give you praise and thanks for the members of this chamber, the families from which they come. We pray as we deliberate in this chamber that your spirit would abide in each and every one of us and that each of the problems we will find solutions and that armed with that powerful hand, we will take on the challenges that are about our community. And we pray that as these chamber members make decisions, that they be mindful that we have elected them to do what's best for all of our citizens. Amen. 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 Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, and so now we have Father Swick. If you'd like to come up, please, and I'll join you. Hey. Hey there. How you doing? Yeah. Very good to see you. Seeing you. That's why I said, hey, I wasn't sure you remembered me. Good to see you. <laughs> you as well, praise God. That was my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a while. It's good to see you again. It's nice to see you, too. How about you come over <coughs> on this side? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Father <laughs> Swick, who has joined me up here, is uh, known to all of us, I think. He has served in the United States Marine Corps, earning a Bronze Star, a Purple Heart. He's a Presidential Unit Citation, a Combat Action rib Ribbon, and a Vietnam. Vietnam Cross of Gallantry. You are so brave. Thank you for your service. He is currently the chairman and CEO of the Tampa Bay Veterans Alliance and serves as the Reverend of St. Francis of Assisi, Old Catholic Church in Dunedin. Since the late 19th century, each year in May, Americans pause to observe Memorial Day, a special day and national holiday set aside to remember with dignity and admiration those who made the ultimate sacrifice and service to <clears throat> our nation. Throughout our nation's history, brave men and women of the military have stepped forward to protect our country. Today, our service men and women continue to inspire and strengthen our nation, going above and beyond the call of duty as part of the greatest military the world has ever known. We are grateful to all those who have donned our nation's uniform and to their families, and we will always remember their service and sacrifice for our freedom. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that May 30th, 2022, be recognized as Memorial Day. We have a, a presentation for the National Historic Preservation Month proclamation. 
I would like to ask Tom, Tom Schofield, who is the Principal Planner for Housing and Community Development, and John Barry, Vice Chairman of the Historic Preservation Board, to join me at the podium. Hello, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good morning. How you doing? Hi. Since 2005, the National Park Service and National Trust for Historic Preservation, along with state and local governments, businesses, and civic organizations across the nation, celebrate National Historic Preservation Month during the month of May. Historic preservation continues to be relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, and for all Americans. It's important to acknowledge, understand, and remember our national, state, and local history and the contributions made by individuals and organizations to pre preserve the tangible aspects of our heritage. Pinellas County has 61 individual properties and 10 historic districts with over 7,700 historic buildings, structures, and sites listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 27 historical markers have been erected in Pinellas County, commemorating events, places, and people important to our history. Historic preservation has proven to be an effective planning tool for managing growth, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering pride, and maintaining community character and identity in Pinellas <coughs> County's communities. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the month of May 2022 be recognized as National Historic Preservation Month. And I have one for both of you. So. <coughs> And I would like to let everyone know that our chair, Commissioner Justice, is not with us today because he's home recuperating. And we hope that he's doing a lot better and that he'll be back with us the next time we meet. <clears throat> so uh, without further ado, though, I'd like to have uh, Chuck Carlin, Carlin. The, gen the general manager for the Tampa Bay Water, join us, please, for a presentation. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the board. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chuck Carden, and I'm the uh, General Manager of Tampa Bay Water, your regional wholesale water provider. Uh, Tampa Bay Water was created by the member governments almost 25 years ago. Uh, next year will be our 25th anniversary. And uh, we were chosen to be your sole and exclusive drinking water <coughs> provider at that time. The local government's decision to create Tampa Bay Water back in 1998 is one of the reasons our economy and our environment has thrived for the last 25 years. <coughs> water fuels our economy, and we built a diversified interconnected system that has supplied our region for more than two decades. And you can see this slide. Uh, that is our network. Uh, and back in 1998, everything to the south, uh, probably uh, where it says Tampa Bypass Canal was built uh, from the uh, alternative water supplies 
back in 1998. This graph is uh, illustrating our sources today. We have three water sources. We have desal water, we have river water, and we have groundwater still. And the significance of this graph shows um, the percentages of each. And back in 1998, this was an easy chart. It was completely groundwater, and it was 100%. And some of you may remember the days of water wars is, is a coined term. These are some demands uh, today versus about five years from now, our projections. And as you can see, Hillsborough and Pasco County uh, are dominating uh, the growth that's coming and has already come. Uh, Pinellas is there, the third uh, set of uh, barge uh, there. You're pretty steady at about 50 million gallons a day. And so those are the projections we're working on uh, to supply your sources. Um, and so by 2028, we'll be needing to put some new sources online to take care of the growth. Since 2018, we've been studying three water supply options to determine the feasibility of the next water supply uh, project. First one is a new groundwater well field in southern Hillsborough County, made possible through aquifer recharge credits. And those are very important. Uh, talk about real briefly on the next slide. Um, the second project is expanding our current surface water treatment plant capacity. And the third one is expanding our seawater desalination plant. Last week, we held our Tampa Bay Water Board meeting, and the board voted to remove the proposed South Hillsborough County well field from consideration and put it back into the long-term master water plan for consideration at a later time. And the reasoning was because of the recharge credits. We could not negotiate uh, with Hillsborough County for this project, and therefore we've pulled it out of the selection, and uh, we'll put it back in and see how it works into the future. So we'll be concentrating our efforts this summer on the two remaining projects. And that is the, the well field, and I'll just briefly say the cost down at the bottom, $1.12 to $1.72, um, that is without the reclaim credit that we could negotiate. So this is uh, the main reason why that project's not moving forward at this time. The surface water treatment uh, plant expansion uh, could yield us another 10 to 15 million gallons a day and would maximize our current permitted surface water withdrawals. The project does include two options, uh, first one being expand the surface water treatment plant at its existing site near the fairgrounds in Brandon, or building a new surface water treatment plant uh, right near the reservoir in southern Hillsborough County. The capital cost uh, for this project ranges range between $91 million and $146 million, and the life cycle <coughs> O&M cost uh, $1.44 to $2.31. The desal plan is very important to our system. It is truly a uh, drought-proof supply, and it can meet 10% of our region's uh, drinking water needs. This facility could be expanded to produce a, an additional 10 million gallons per day, but it's highly mechanical, and it's very costly. As you can see, the, the ranges uh, for the capital is between 310 million and 365 million and that equates to a cost per thousand gallons of about $8.56. And I mentioned cost on the last two slides uh, in my overviews, but cost is only one factor that we're going to consider, that the board's going to consider when it selects a new project. Uh, they will also consider environmental uh, sustainability and reliability. Under each of these detailed, uh, under these headings, there's some detailed criteria, for example, Cost includes the capital cost, the operations and maintenance cost, life cycle cost, and whether the project can be phased or not. Under environmental stewardship, that includes uh, permitting, carbon footprint, and public acceptance. And under the reliability bucket, resiliency, technology, risk factors, and how the project will fit in with the overall system that we've already built. So over the next few months, we'll be discussing these project concepts with uh, the utility directors from each of the member governments, with the public, and of course the board. Uh, our board is expected to make a decision on the new project uh, probably in August now, since we uh, took that one project out. It was scheduled for later in the fall, uh, but 
we're looking at, we think we'll be ready by August to present to our board, but there's going to be some work done educating um, some public uh, meetings. And so by August, we think we'll be ready to have the board select the new water supply project. <coughs> And with that, that concludes my brief presentation, and I'd be very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cardin, so much. Are there any questions from members? Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, I wanted to, um, to, to, to let you know that uh, Chuck came on board as, uh, well, you've been here probably for how many years, 30 years? Uh, 30 years next March, yeah, if I could uh, hang on. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> and, and Tampa uh, Bay Water? Yes, yes. yeah. Oh my Doesn't look old enough, does he? No, you uh, don't. So did, <laughs> I started when I was in fifth grade. a baby. <laughs> Thank uh, you. But he came on board as our, our general manager last uh, August. Uh, I'm very proud of the work he's done and uh, stabilized not only uh, the things within the staff, but also among our partners um, that participate in Tampa Bay Water. So really proud of that, uh, that, that, that change that we made, and uh, I think Tampa Bay Water is uh, much better off uh, with him there. I did want to just say that we're talking about a water supply project that is going to be coming on board the end of the decade. We're also extensively looking at a water quality uh, project that um, will take uh, that water quality that meets all the standards, mostly the well water, that meets all of the standards and elevate it to even a higher quality for all of our residents. And since Pinellas County gets a predominance of well water coming here, um, it's an important piece and that will be being looked at as well. And then the part about public acceptance, I think is gonna be something that all of us will be talking about in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that is how to use reclaimed water. And will that become a water supply source down the road, say 10, 15 years down the road? And that conversation, I think we need to start having now. There was a recent poll done. I think they came to our commission at a workshop and said that uh, folks, when educated about reclaimed water, had less uh, um, reservation about uh, having it as a, you know, considered as a potable water source. I, I, I didn't necessarily believe that survey, but uh, I think we're moving in that direction over the next 10 to 15 years, and certainly that is being used around the country and something that we'll have to at least grapple with. But looking forward to the selection of the water supply project, and um, I'm sorry that the Hillsborough County couldn't come to um, some kind of agreement on, on our reclaimed water credit. Um, it seems like when we're trying to get rid of it, we're just trying to get rid of it. And then all of a sudden when somebody wants it, it has a new value system to it. So it's been a little bit of frustration for all of us in dealing with some of the issues um, on the other side of the bay, but we're trying to be constructive and productive. And the best thing right now is, as you said, to remove that one for consideration for this next water supply source. So anyway, thanks for being here and, and, and giving us a, a, at least an update. Yes, and I appreciate uh, that. I plan to be back. I, I'd like to do this twice a year if you'll have me, uh, just to keep you up to date on what what's happening with the system. Um, if I did that, uh, I think we would already be past that selection, and I could tell you how things are going and talk more about the, the water quality project that you brought up. Any Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you for coming. This was very informative and really um, helped to clarify some things for questions that I've been asked in my community when it comes to the sources of water and how those sources flow southward for us. I met you some years ago through my brother-in-law, Watson Haynes, when he served on the board for Tampa Bay Water. Oh, okay. Uh, 2005 or so, somewhere in there. So anyway, hey. Um, one of the questions I guess I have is, um, because of course when DeSalle first was even in a conversation, it was a whole lot of um, uh, conversation around the saltiness and residual and getting rid of that and what would it do to any outlying water areas. Um, I'm just curious as to whether or not um, maybe there's a partnership with any university that's looking at making the desal option cheaper. Um, University of South Florida here mm -hmm. in St. Pete just got a ton of money for its oceanography um, programs and I would see this maybe as something that they would consider taking on to help bring down that cost um, of $8.56 you know, per thousand gallons because that is a lot. And that is a good source of water, um, of course, with us being um, vigilant and trying to conserve, you know, not let the water run and things of that nature. So I didn't know if maybe you all had thought about any partnerships to try to 
We're okay. always looking for partnerships. So we've had quite a few over the last uh, several years since I've been in, involved in Tampa Bay Water, uh, trying to figure out exactly <coughs> what you're, you're, you're speaking to, of getting the cost down. Primarily, that would be the power. If we could figure out how to cut the power cost, that's predominantly the, the main expense. Okay. Um, so solar, um, we've looked into that, and you know, as technology, what the good thing is, is with time, technology is improving, improving, and so you know, we want to continue to look at that. I would, I will encourage staff back in Tampa Bay Water. We're going to reach out and maybe talk to some of the universities, see what's out there now, to see where we can get some cheaper power, um, and also energy recovery. Um, we have an energy recovery uh, system at the the desal plant, but it's. Um, 2004 technology, and so <clears throat> as the plant's needing some upgrades, there's a place to look into that right mm -hmm. there, of not only you know just trying to recover that pressure that you, you've produced and use it again as electricity. So um, I think there is a place to to look into that, um, and reaching out to the universities is is a great idea. Thank you, and thank you again for being here. This is really good information. And you've recently joined a, a consortium, I guess, from around the world that gets together and talks about new technology and and new innovations and new and new you know product uh, improvements and enhancements. So I'm glad I'll be looking forward to seeing how that kind of helps bring step up our game even even higher. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. We just uh, we're it's called knowledge to implementation. It's a group of. Uh, it's growing, but it was at 12 uh, utilities worldwide. Uh, it's not just limited to the uh, United States or North America, but it's worldwide. There's Singapore, uh, there's Israel. Israel's got uh, their, their leading national utility, and so we are um, becoming members of that. And what it is is uh, you get together and you exchange ideas, best management practices on, on all kinds of subjects. That is one. A lot of, there's a lot of diesel knowledge out there. And so we will definitely look into that to, to try to gain some knowledge exactly uh, as we spoke of earlier. So it seems like the people in Dubai have that down pat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, that's their drinking water, and they know their drinking water pretty yeah. well. So. I'm curious about one thing that you said, if you don't mind. It seemed a bit contradictory. And that is, did you say that you were in discussions about the reclaimed water and now you're not you decided to pull that out is that what i understood the right the, no but I'm I, sorry. Just, yeah just real quickly hillsborough county's uh, injecting reclaimed water treated reclaimed water in the on the coast near uh, big bend power station and um, they're that enables us to be able to withdraw inland some fresh water but we have to establish a credit with them to do that. That's where we did not uh, connect. And so we, we're not going to get there in time for the board to make a selection, so we're passing on that project right now. And possibly into the future, we can, we can renew those discussions and maybe we can get to an agreement. We cannot take water out without the credits. And so it will not be permitted by the district and so at this point, we can't wait any longer. The other two projects are waiting uh, to be chosen. <clears throat> and so that's the whole decision point. And, and so, so what happens to their project now in terms of? They continue to put water into the, uh, the, the deep wells because it's keeping them from uh, having saltwater intrusion. And it also helps, as you all probably heard about uh, Senate Bill 64, I think Hayes and Sawyer was here a couple of weeks ago. And so you've got till 2032 to do something with your sewer, your uh, reclaim. reclaim water in, in the lieu of putting it out on surface water bodies. So that takes care of that as well. So as far as I understand, they're going to still do that for now. What they didn't want to commit to in, in primarily was a long-term agreement. So we were looking at 30 years and maybe 20 years. We cannot do a project and then have it stop before, you know, it has to go long-term. That was the big sticking point. Maybe there'll be some changes into the future, yeah. and we can work that out. All those rates are very sensitive to the length of the term that we that we finance these projects. <coughs> these are twenty and thirty year amortization projects, and if you do, if you do it in ten years, the prices go up, and then people you know aren't, aren't at risk. So I think it's really important that we get everybody on board with that. So yeah. we'll see. Well, I would agree with you. I would like to have more <coughs> than once a year discussions about it because it's a very deep and complicated subject matter, number one. 
Number two, not all of us have served on Tampa Bay water, and so we're somewhat at a disadvantage to either read about it or hear about it or when we're visiting with our neighbors across the pond uh, and they start talking about it, you're a little bit out of your element because we don't really have all the facts and we don't know what the current status is. So maybe we can look forward to having you one day come to our workshop and talk about it a little more in depth. I'd love to, and I'd offer anyone who would like a tour, please, uh, I've taken some of you on tours. It's a long day. Hopefully it's uh, informative, but I would offer any of you would like a tour to see our facilities. Um, you, you really, you know, you can see pictures and you can hear about it, but until you see them, uh, amazing. And it's very, it's very eye-opening. So for anybody that hasn't done that, I would encourage you to do so. And the other thing that, that Chuck's done in the last year is really up, up the involvement even further with our utility directors. So all of our utility directors go to all of them, or go to the meetings. Uh, we have very robust involvement. So if any of you <laughs> want more detailed understanding of any of the issues, our utility folks are up to speed. His utility folks are up to speed anytime. If we're in a workshop, we can do that. Or if you want me to wax on about it, I can wax on as much oh, as, well. as you want me to about Tampa Bay Water. It's just, it's been the the, the most amazing. Well, you're an engineer, course. so we need someone that can talk, you know, people Wait a talk. minute. I resent that. I meant, I meant it as a high compliment. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Thank you so right. much, Thank Mr. Card. Being here, we were going to behave. Yes, we are. This is, a, this is an example. Um, and now we're on to citizens be, to be heard. And I see that we have. Goodbye. Thank you, all Thank you very Father. Much. Have God a great you. day. See you, Father. Great Bob. Memorial Enjoy Day. Bye. Bye, uh, David Balagetis Jr., would you like to come forward, please? You have three minutes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Uh, David Balagetis Jr., I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Pinellas County, again, Pinellas County has been sold to the Water District in both ordinance and resolution. This sale is reflected in statute law as a 30-year fee simple title transfer. This title transfer is seen as a transfer of both function and power in the County Home Rule Charter Section 2.04Q. As sold to the Water District, the county is to be slowly dissolved. The Water District, as evident on the county ad valorem property tax lien, is intending to slowly, line by line, assume all the functions and powers of the county, giving rise to not a property tax lien, but to give rise to a Water District levy in this process. Simultaneously, in a quid pro quo agreement with the district, um, the county is expecting to be born again as a 14th Amendment water jurisdiction and to directly tax the civilian population in the form of a levy as enumerated from Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. Now, based on the Declaration of Independence, the 14th Amendment water <coughs> jurisdiction rebelliously gives rise to the legislation of the British Brethren as being privileged and immune. The Indians tax-free in the 14th Amendment also applies to the 12 tribes of Israel as being tax-free and as deduced. It is self-evident that the Gentiles, the Christians, are the ones that are being subjected to losing their liberty, property, and life claimed as due process in the 14th Amendment and as based on such political usurpation and insurrections of powers, I do have a 14th Amendment grievance both therein and a First Amendment grievance thereof. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. Uh, and next waiting to be heard, I believe, on Zoom is Stacy Geyer. Stacy, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please, and state your name and your address, and you'll have three minutes. My name is Stacy Geyer. I live in Largo. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. 
I first wanted to start out with um, just frustration over the lawsuit that was filed against the state in regards to the redistricting that requires two of the commissioners to run for re-election. Um, the constituents did not want that. And it did seem like Jewel White encouraged it and you all went forward with it. Um, thank you, Commissioner Seal, um, for recusing yourself. And Commissioner Flowers, I wish you had recused yourself. I think that is the ethical thing that should have been done since it affected um, both of your seats. Um, now that you have lost that lawsuit because it didn't get filed against the right entity, which should have been Pinellas County Secretary of Elections, whom the county attorney, Joel White, also represents, um, now you have, if you go forward with suing the county elect, um, secretary of elections, you have to uh, um, retain an outside attorney. And I imagine that the secretary of elections will too. So I'm just wondering how much money this has already cost Pinellas County taxpayers. So I ask that you please consider dropping this lawsuit and, and just going forward with it. As I can tell right now, as it looks, and maybe I'm wrong, it seems like um, Commissioner Flowers doesn't even have anybody running against her. So I don't understand why this still needs to be going on. Um, my next concern is with the Plan Pinellas. Um, I do try and keep up with everything going on in the county, but it is hard to keep track of all of it. Um, so I am just seeing the information, um, but I have some issues just based on the guidelines alone. Um, and I just see some inconsistencies with what the goals are versus what action is actually being taken. Um, the, one of the guidelines that I saw was to create and enhance safe, healthy communities that attract and retain a socially and culturally diverse population. I agree that we should be looking into affordable housing options as prices continue to skyrocket. Um, Something I, I don't know any of you personally, so you wouldn't know about me that I actually did grow up in government housing with a single mom. So I know what these high rise um, communities are like. They suck the hope out of people. I wish as our county commissioners trying to do what's best for our county that you would look into some sort of a voucher system, um, some sort of way to really diversify the housing that would have people of all incomes living in multiple areas as opposed to those who need um, income help with their housing stuck in one area. Was that my timer? Yes, th thank you, Stacy. Okay. your time thank is you. up now. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have Mr. David Happy. Mr. Happy, are you there? Mr. Happy? Can you still see if he's there? Is he Madam there? Chair, it doesn't appear he's present. He's not present. All right, well, maybe he'll come back to us at a later moment. Uh, is there anyone else waiting in the queue? I don't have. No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, now we will move on to the consent agenda, and we are going to pull for the moment items 17 and 19. And if I could have, a, is there anything else that needs to be pulled? By virtue of my colleagues here, no? Move approval of the consent agenda minus item 17 and 19. Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor of passing the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 All right. Now we'll go to item 14. Barry, would you like to speak to that, please? Yeah. Item yes, 17 is our, our, our emergency rental assistance program. Yes. So the emergency rental assistance program, as you're aware, we had over 5,300 households that have been assisted to date, which includes uh, merging the program with St. Petersburg. We've had $36 million spent out of the $45 million grant. Um, <laughs> however, Tetra Tech, which is the company that has been um, overseeing the program, has failed on a couple of different stand performance standards. And so that's the reason we're requesting a change to uh, the companies. Um, you, you had asked a question at the workshop last Thursday about penalties for um, contractual issues. And they do have a, um, a, a remedy, a financial <coughs> remedy, 
to contract modifications, and those have been applied. And so, so the the terms um, have been applied as as uh, at, to date. We've uh, withheld. Um, let's see, it's over sixty thousand dollars in uh, financial penalties for performance, and uh, there there'll be additional penalties with that three percent. It's a three percent uh, reduction that'll be applied as we close out the final invoices that they're processing. To date, uh, Whitmer O'Brien's uh, has commenced a call center on May the 16th. There's training staff now. Uh, it's underway to initiate the program tomorrow with the approval of this agreement today. Um, so they, they, any applicant can review their online status through Neighborly. Um, and again, all of them will be notified uh, during this change. We are watching um, the Treasury guidelines because they will have uh, reallocated funds, so there may be opportunities uh, to apply for additional ones, but that won't be out until June. And so with this change, again, we hope to continue processing the applications, address some of the uh, performance issues with the revised company, um, but we also are looking for additional potential additional federal funds if they become available. Excellent. Any questions? Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Bear, we we received an email letting us know that um, information was going out to the public about us no longer taking new applications. Right. Um, and so if we have about $9 million or so left, is that enough to potentially cover what's in the, pipe, what's in the pipeline already? Or uh, we have are we over? And if we're over, do we have uh, a plan on you know, are we going to try to find the funds to cover those or have to notify persons? I'm going to uh, ask Bruce to come up and uh, maybe address that the, because I don't know the exact gap. The the issue, though, um, we anticipate to be out of funds by July, okay? Mm -hmm. And and beca because we have currently applications that will exceed the amount of available funds. Right. So we have applications that will exceed that amount. We're looking to the federal funds. If absent the federal funds, then, then there would be a gap. Okay. Um, and then obviously we'd have to have you know discussions about uh, funding sources for any, anything that would cover that. These are federal funds. They're very specific in the application and what they can be applied for. I'd be hesitant to supplement anything else for a federal program. Um, we really need to stick to the guidelines. At least that would be my recommendation. Well, that's why I was asking in case, you know, I don't know how many people it would be that may not be able to have completed the process, um, and would we be informing them in time enough for maybe them to start looking at some other options? Okay. That's why I was asking. Maybe, maybe Bruce, you can address that. Hey, Bruce. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, Bruce Bussey, Housing and Community Development Manager. Um, we did send out emails to any applicants that had started an application this month, letting them know that the application will be closing down. Um, we've done that based on the number of applications we have in the pipeline. We do think we'll probably exceed the amount of funding we have remaining available. So we were early on, we were estimating probably a June, late June time frame. Um, our Florida program kind of surprisingly closed down about two weeks ago. So it sort of became unfortunate timing that our number of applications quickly have ramped up over the last two weeks as we're transitioning. So in order to prevent people from applying and running out of dollars, we want to minimize that. So we think the time is is right that we need to, to stop taking applications, work through that backlog. If we would have any additional dollars available, we could reopen, but we're, we're estimating that we probably have as many applications now in the process that we'll be able to fund. Um, once we know better about where we are, I would love to know how many persons we were not able to assist as a result of, um, I don't want to say overcommitment, but uh, we don't have enough funds to cover their requests. I would love to know that um, number if that's possible. And I appreciate that you guys are going to be looking to see if there is an opportunity to garner some dollars. Um, I'll certainly continue the places. monthly monthly yeah. reports and, and any other updated information. And as soon as we do reach the point where we are out of funds, we'll be notifying all applicants at that time. We'll, we'll certainly provide an update to the board as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Buzzy. Be in here. All right. And now number 19. Move on to 19. You want to? We need to vote on it. I was going to take it up together, okay. but if you want to do it separately, we can do it, that. That's up to you guys. It's, it's up right? to you. Okay, number, um, item number 19. So I'll ask Mary Celeste to come up. Um, here we have a tie bid 
Um, and so under the uh, procurement rules, um, uh, the tie bid is done by a selection by the chair of the county commission. Oh my uh, goodness. So Mary Thank can you, explain uh, the way our purchasing ordinance works and um, what we're here to perform. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, Mary Celeste, uh, uh, Administrative Services, Purchasing and Risk. Uh, this Today we're asking you to award this contract, but we do have tie unit pricing. Um, I, in subcategories 3.3, 3.4, and 3.8 between two vendors. So according to purchasing policy, I'm going to do this the old-fashioned way. I have three envelopes, <laughs> 3.4, 3.3, 3.8, and both vendors have a selection inside. So if I can ask you to unseal the envelope, pull out just one of them, and call out the name of the vendor, then we'll know which vendor won that subcategory, and we will go back complete the agreements with the appropriate not to exceed amount, submit to the county attorney's office for review and approve as to form, and then um, after the vendor signs, and then we will take those agreements over to your office for signature. All right, do you want me to come down there? Sure. All right, I'll be right there. Uh, or I can hand them to you, which, whichever's easiest well, for you. you can't People can't see me. I think I'll come down there. Okay. Make it all above four. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to see her flip a coin. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <clears throat> okay, so here's subgroup 3.3. And when you pull up a little tab, if you wouldn't mind reading the vendor's name, just for the record. The pressure is on, Janet. What? The pressure is on. <laughs> I know. <coughs> there's two in there. Oh, there's two in there. Yeah, there's only two vendors. Backflow apparatus. And that is one of our vendors. So Yay, there you go. So 3-3 three, three will go to backflow apparatus. Okay. So we have a record of that. 3.4, I'll let you. How many are in here? Just two. It's the same two vendors. Okay. Are any of the vendors here? I, was I don't think so. Okay. Backflow apparatus. Oh my gosh. Who could ever figure? Okay. And see, here's the other one. So I just wanted to show you there were two in there. Gosh, my heart is racing. Okay, and subgroup 3.8. <laughs> it's a 50 50 shot. Test gauge. Okay, that was the second vendor. Okay. So the last subgroup will go to test gauge. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you for helping facilitate this. We appreciate exciting. it. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Backflow, backflow, and test gauge. So there were th they, they, they broke them down into subgroups, and right. so they, they had to pick one. But since they're the, they're the two tying bids, they had to that's how it came out. Down to the penny. <laughs> All right, and now we can go back to item 17 and vote on that. May I have a motion, please? Move approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. And I guess we don't need to vote on 19, right, Jewel? Yeah. We've already handled that? Well, we have no, I think you would, would you? Do we? I would recommend that you go ahead and vote on approving the, mm -hmm. the lots that were drawn. Okay. I move to approve backflow, backflow, and test gauge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, to break the tie for the bids um, for service. All right. And may we have a second? Second. And Commissioner Agros has seconded it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 
All right, and now we are on our um, <coughs> one minute, please. Let me get to my place. Three. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. Page nine. Page nine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Page nine. Yes, thank you. Our regular agenda. All right. Um, item 23. Barry? Okay, so item 23 and 24 go together. This is a uh, ranking of firms with Mason Blue and Associates. This is for the design services pertaining to the construction of the uh, new North County Service Center. All right. Any discussion, members? Well, M move approval of item 23 and 24. Okay. Second, and do we have a second? Well, are we doing 23 or? Yeah, you said they were together. They're well, to no, they're a companion item. If you want me to add 24, 24 is the same thing, except that is the construction manager um, services, uh, co construction manager at risk. So the first is design, second is the construction manager at risk for the project. Okay. So we have a we have a motion. Can we have a second, please? Um, second. second for discussion. I just wanted to ask a quick question. To make okay, sure Commissioner Eggers, for your discussion. Yeah, yeah just on this. So we're, we're approving the, the, the contractor at risk and the design services, but not the actual construction. We're, that's to be determined. The correct. construction costs are, will come in later for our approval. That's correct. Okay. So you're going to get the design. You're going to have a construction manager at risk. They're going to they're going to yeah, do the scoping. They're going to bring that back to you, and then we'll approve. They'll have to go out to bid, but that's also the, the, under a construction manager at risk. They'll bid those packages out, they'll bring those in, and then they'll guarantee that maximum price. And, and, and this has been an overall effort to consolidate our services that are in the North County. It, maybe you could just speak briefly to the effort here and perhaps even, you know, some of the cost savings that we're going to enjoy from not being a rented, sure. a rental or a lessee <laughs> across the street. You know. Joe Laurel with Administrative Services. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, this is really a consolidation on the east, south, just southeast of the new North County Service Center, the tax collector and property appraiser lease space. So we're going to move them into this new building once completed. It's going to save between seven eight hundred thousand dollars a year in lease space costs. Seven to eight hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, a year. Of course, it's going to probably cost between thirty to thirty-four million dollars to build a new building. We don't know yet until we price it out, but. But that being said, yeah, there are there are some savings over the term. In all the in all three, the, the clerk will have a, yeah. a presence there. The yeah, and the yeah, the tax collector will have about forty thousand mm -hmm. square feet. The clerk will have about five thousand, and the property appraiser about seven thousand in the new building, which so, leaves some extra space. So all of it will that. move from the, the facility. Well, there's there's some on the west side now. <coughs> so he said it'll yeah, all from move the east to the side west. to the west side. Yeah, and that really doesn't include all the costs because you currently yeah. have um, an underperforming building there that, in all likelihood, would have been a request yeah. for renovation or expansion of that facility in addition to consolidating it. So rather than looking them in independently, they looked at all the services together to have a consolidated center. And yeah. so in that new facility, we'll have we'll still have the driving course in the back. Mm -hmm. We'll still have the the recycle <sighs> yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. center. Then a parking garage, mm -hmm. and then the building. You got it. <coughs> yep, exactly. Yep. Thank you. Yes, Thank sir. you. Joe. I'm Commissioner Seal. Um, not really a question, just a comment. <clears throat> the when we had the presentation at the work session, let's be realistic in knowing that this is going to be a very expensive project, and the payback is a lot longer than what we're saving in rent. So. Um, yeah, I would just urge people to do plain vanilla, make it um, a plain vanilla office building mm -hmm. and as efficient as possible, especially what we've learned for space requirements because of COVID. Mm -hmm. yes, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else for discussion? No? So we're good? I just had Maybe. one other comment uh, okay. to, to Commissioner Seal's point. Um, the, li the life of a building like this, Joe, Joe, uh, are we talking 50, 40, 50 year life of the building? Okay. All right. And I think, and, and again, I just think as far as, as rent prices at 800,000 800, to a million dollars, over time, 
with less construction going on, I think rates are going to be sensitively higher. I think the payback, to your point, is a little bit longer. It's not like a 10-year payback, but we're talking probably 30 years before you re you rely, you know, you get what you want out of this building. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a big it is a big cost item. Consolidating is one of the things that we've been working on for, I guess, almost eight to 10 years of facilities so that our residents can go to one place for all the work. Uh, I agree with your comment, though, about this needs to be a institutional government building. <laughs> We're not making an architectural statement uh, to the world. Um, so anyway, that's just my comment. Yeah. So I look for we, well, we would agree. bringing it in for a landing. OK, but now I feel compelled to say, with all of that that has been said, I hope there will be a focus on the resiliency and sustainability piece of that new building because those savings are, are all, should also be added in, number one. And number two, with the advances in technology that have the potential to help us do more with less, I think is something we all need to keep our eye on the ball with. And we've, we've discussed those as part of this. Yep. Excellent. Very happy to hear that. OK, so are we in a position to a motion to second. for a motion? A motion that he seconded. Let's OK, see. well then, are we, are we good to vote on our machines? Could the clerk unlock the machine and the commissioners be prepared to vote? And Hopefully. On both or just on one? Both. Well, we have to do them one at a time, don't we, clerks? On mm -hmm. 23. Let's do 23. Yeah, it just popped up. Oh, what is my computer? I don't know if this computer is going to allow me to do that. Oops. Okay. Then we do the join. Did we get? I don't have. Did you join? Did you join? I did. Okay. Um, I'm a yes. This is my personal one. Is it working? Oh, there I am. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what am I? You got it. David, you, you did. Got it. What did you do? I didn't do anything. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. Yeah, you're on 20. Okay, here. Oh, what is that? Oh. All right. On to number 25. Oh, we didn't vote on 24. Let's vote on 24, please. We've had a motion and a second for that as well. Please unlock that machine and let us prepare to vote. Yeah. Yeah. And that passes unanimously. And now we are on 25. 25 is an award of bid to Oshkosh Airport Products. This is for an aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicle in the amount of $783,000. OK. Any questions on this one, colleagues? Move approval. It's been a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Please, second. Um, questions? Commissioner Seal, did you have something? All right, please can open the board. There we go. All right, and that passes unanimously. And now we are on item number 26. This is a grant application for federal assistance submissions to the Federal Aviation Administration for airport improvements uh, at uh, St. Pete and Clearwater International Airport. Here you can see that the um, PIE's uh, apportionment for FY22 is 4.9 million. However, you know, and this is a 90% federal share of money. They're also anticipating future allocations based upon the amount of employments um, in each calendar year. This allows them to advance and work on the first three phases of the airport terminal expansion project. So pretty exciting for PIE. It's very exciting for the airport and for the county because our numbers, 
I see Tom in the audience, did I not? You did. What are our numbers now, Tom? Passengers coming and going. Come on up. Good <laughs> afternoon. I'm just got quite an empire director. going on out there. Yeah, we're doing uh, we're doing very well. We'll probably see close to our 2019 numbers by the end of this year, which will push us about 2.3 million. Unbelievable. So, yeah, we're uh, we're coming back strong. And do we have any new destinations that Allegiance prepared to talk about? Prepared to talk about, no, um, but I will be coming back with uh, some news probably in the next 30 days. Nice. So, yeah. And do we have another airline out there now? That's who, we'll, yeah, we'll be talking about that. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. The spot. We Curious. will be bringing an agreement back at, at a later date for new service, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Any questions? Let me just real quick. I'm just the incident that we had yesterday out mm -hmm. there. Any any repercussions from that? Any? No, anything? there were no injuries associated with it. It was a twin engine aircraft that uh, basically the brakes failed on it. Uh, the pilot uh, went off the end of the runway and ended up actually on the fence line. But uh, fortunately, mm. he was able to uh, maneuver the aircraft, even though he didn't have brakes around various navigational aids and even a billboard near the end of the runway. But kudos to him that he yeah. kept from going on to Almerton Road. Could you just have imagined what a nightmare yeah. that could have been? Yeah, yeah, very blessed. He this must have been terrified. So that just, you know, that's what I was going to ask, how close that was. And is, I mean, close to Almerton. Do we have enough there? Um, yeah, there is, um, if what you're asking, we have a runway safety area that's associated with the runway to provide enough room in case of an instance like that so that if the aircraft goes off. Uh, so through the fence, we still have. It didn't go through the fence. It no, I know it didn't. There, but but <laughs> what do we have on the other side of the fence? Uh, Almerton. So it's my question: mm, yeah. Do we have enough room there? There is enough room based on the FA requirements as far as distance that we need to maintain. So yes, we meet all those requirements. Okay. So do we know why the brakes failed? No, the uh, NTSB was called out to go ahead and they'll be doing an investigation, but we probably won't hear anything for at least several weeks, at least. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about, um, you, you have the gangways so the people don't have to get wet when they get off the plane or go out into the heat. You have, like, how many of those? Because when I came in the other day, um, we were getting out in the heat. Luckily, it wasn't raining yet. Yeah. But um, is there a plan to get all of them so that it's in interior and not? Yeah, yeah. right now we have uh, two boarding bridges out of the 12 gates, parking positions that we have. Uh, the next phases of terminal development that we'll, I'll be coming back later this year to discuss uh, basically uh, provides a lot of efficiencies, consolidates uh, the passive screening checkpoint, uh, connects the, uh, both departure gate areas, and it's all going to be second floor, all supported by boarding bridges. Okay, so yes. then there's, there's a long-term plan for all of them to have those covered yes. bridges then? Yes. Great, because when I came in the last time I was in one of those and I was like, oh, yay, we're finally there. And yeah. then when I came in a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, we're not all the way there yet. Yeah, <laughs> well, we're going to get there again. Baby uh, steps. Baby that, steps. Uh, the next phase of terminal will be all second floor. Okay. So we're right now, everything's first floor, so we don't have those opportunities to have boarding bridges in certain places. Okay. All right, thanks. Right. I appreciate it. Great. Commissioner Flowers, did you have? No. I Good I job. Had. Three Daughters Brewery, I think. You is. got it. We're going to come in tomorrow there. at three. Yep, coming in so, there. And come on out and raise a glass. Mm. What did you just say? Three Daughters Brewery. Oh, is. that's right. It yeah, has a ribbon coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So, Congratulations yeah, on that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was that voted on? Okay. Was that voted on? So, do I have. Do we have a, we had a motion? You had a motion and a second. Shall we? Oh, no? I don't think He's we, saying no. no I move, move approval. <laughs> second. <laughs> Kathleen. First. Okay, now we're ready. Would you please open the board and let us vote? Oh. All right. Thank you. That passed unanimously, 26. That was, that was 26. Okay, 27. I apologize. 27 is a 
Um, Pinellas County Sheriff Police Ath Athletic Pleasure. League. Um, this is a request for a municipal taxing unit um, project to uh, for um, new portable classrooms. They received a grant from uh, Juvenile Welfare Board. However, as we know, prices have increased. Hence, they're asking for eighteen thousand four hundred dollars to complete the project. Move approval. Second. 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 <clears throat> All right. It's been moved and approved. Would you please? Are there any questions or discussion? No. Can you please unlock the machine and let us? Be prepared to vote. Thank you. All right, and that passed unanimously. Thank you very much. On to 728. This is a data sharing agreement between Florida Department of Economic Opportunity and Pinellas County Economic Development. Um, this establishes confidential guidelines uh, for working <coughs> with them on cases. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No? All right, would you please unlock the machine and, and we will vote. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. That passed unanimously. 29. This is uh, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, this is a revised spending plan as we reviewed uh, last Thursday. Um, it talks and we sent you an update which gives you kind of a comparison and also a little explanation about the reason for the changes. And so again, um, this uh, we would ask for your approval. Move approval. Sick. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, questions, or comments? So I'm Commissioner very Eggers. yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm assuming a great percentage of this is now freed up penny money, as it resulted in freed up. It, it's freed up some penny money, um, and it's it's freed up. Um, but, uh, but again, a lot of several of the projects were penny money that um, we then expanded. So we were doing some work and now we're going to actually connect the community, for instance, down in Ridgecrest and, and things like that. And so um, it did help with some of the penny money. That's part of the reason that we're balanced. Um, but also it also we also are doing a lot more in those areas. Instead of just repairing sidewalks, we're connecting sidewalks. We're connecting them up to schools and things like that. So it's a lot more than just replacing penny money. My point. And the only thing that struck me a little bit was the um, uh, it seems like 107,000 for cybersecurity, and that was all. Mm -hmm. So I assume that's all that we could justify in the plan. Or well, a lot of it has to do with contracting issues. And so if it wasn't, if it's not put out with the federal requirements under it, then you can't okay. consider it. That's part of the reason we had to shift around for the CAD system. Uh, and do other projects for the sheriff and that freed up dollars to be able to fund the CAD because it wasn't originally bid that way. Okay. So these, are you finished, David? Yeah, I just had one other one. Excuse okay, me. go ahead. The Toy Town study and the monies that we got or we're hoping to get from the state, we'll bring all that back before we get into how that's actually going to be used. Yes, we're going to bring action and engineering report to you and discuss that. Um, and so, and again, you may decide at that point, okay, that project's not worth it. Well, then we'll come back to you with a revised spending plan based upon that discussion. And, and so there'll be, it, it, it's going to be an iterative process through here. It's, it's just like you've seen in here, we go into a project and we think it's going to be 5 million. And then when they actually scope it out, it's actually 7 million. And so. So, and since we're on that subject, just for clarification, we don't have that committed to a particular project as of this date, do we? Which? The Toy Town? The Toy Town, no. Okay. No. Just no, asking. We've, no, we, we've, we've um, we commissioned the engineering report, um, so we've got that. We're going to bring that to you. We put money aside, um, some money aside, and then we went after the, the state money. Now we've got to talk about what it can accomplish, and that'll come to you at a work session here soon. Okay. Um, is, are there any questions from anyone else? Commissioner Flowers? Not a question, just an um, update. Um, BTS, at our last BTS meeting, um, a part of their decision package is going to request some things for cybersecurity or upgrades in those areas, just sharing that information with them. And that's probably going to be an ongoing, ongoing with the way mm -hmm. the world yeah. is going. BTS has no shortage of funding <laughs> requests. Um. <laughs> so, so um, I... No one else? You don't, can I have a question? Commissioner no. Peter? Commissioner Seal? No? Well, I have two things just I'm curious about. The status of the 
renovation and upgrades with regard to unincorporated Seminole recreation facilities improvements. Where are we with that? I, I keep hearing we're making progress, and then I hear, oh, no, the, the three different groups won't play in life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would certainly want Paul Kazi here to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring that to you at a work session. Um, so that, just like with Toy Town, that's a separate discussion about recreation, what we're doing. Um, and we really have to have a plan for how we're going to govern that. They have actually made a lot of progress, but I think he was just wrapping some of that up. Jill is also off today. She's been actively involved in that. So both of the people that can really answer the details of your questions aren't here today. So we certainly, though, will be bringing that to you at a work session. I look forward to that. And my other question is I see the CAD system on here in a couple of, does this give us an opportunity to build the whole thing yes. out as it had been talked about yes. when Chief Slaughter originally got this? The, this is a, I think this is a real game changer and I think is, it's absolutely. one of the, it's probably one of the biggest public safety things that you can actually do. Yep. As you can see though, we're having to move money around because we didn't, when the sheriff bid it, he didn't bid it with the federal requirements in it because uh, the, the ARPA money wasn't available mm -hmm. at that. So we're having to fund other projects to where we can free up dollars to where we can do this. But this will build the entire CAD system out. Um, they have a governance committee for governing how that will continue to operate. And everybody going forward is committed to the maintenance piece and their fair share of that ongoing cost. But it really shouldn't be more than what they're paying for their current system maintenance um, for what they have now. So, but this will be an integrated CAD system and it's pretty exciting. Very nice. Just and it's lovely to see the electrical vehicle infrastructure charging uh, item in there. And uh, it would be nice if we could form partnerships with some of the electric vehicle manufacturers that provide those things. Mm -hmm. I bet you we could get a lot bigger bang for the buck, perhaps. I just had a couple. One other thing, yeah. I could. Mr. Um, and this is this is a plan, uh, Barry, that you all have come up with, and we've kind of said we like the direction of the plan. How many of these projects have we actually approved? I mean, you know, from a from a cost standpoint, or have we approved any of them yet? Chris, do you have an idea on? Well, I mean, you've. you've I mean, actually, approved, we've approved the whole plan, and they're working on, and they're they are they are spending money on it. So I'll, That's, I'll yeah, which ones have we talked to yeah. Chris about that? So we have uh, Chris Rose, Office of Management and Budget. We have your direction to move forward on these plans right now. Uh, we have only actually put forward the first half because that's what we have received from the federal government, about $89 million. So uh, does it translate into actual individual ones? No, you're, you're approving the whole plan as it stands right now. So. But each project that comes, each when we start signing contracts, are those projects coming back here for approval? Oh, it'll be yeah, good yes. and everything else. Absolutely. Right. So we'll be seeing it again, yes. each one of them. Okay. And, and and I think that we're going to bring periodic updates, uh, and yes. not only that, but and we'll bring back revise. I think the what Chris sent you is a good format to be able to, because this will change. They'll get into a project, and all of a sudden we can't do it because of, and a lot of them, we got into several of them, and we said we can't meet the timelines. The deal, huh? You know, like when you get into land acquisition, well, you know, who knows how long that's going to take. And so then we decide, okay, it'd be better if we put the money over here versus here. And that's kind of the iterative process that we're having to use going through this. And then two other questions real quick. And is this plan online anywhere where our residents can see the plan that we're talking about? Because I hear all the time about us having ARPA funds and what are we spending it on. So this is a pretty detailed plan. It is. We do, we do have some of it out there. We're working on getting some better information out there, though. We Much like we've got the penny, the one-pagers, we just we don't have this done yet. We were actually but we are waiting get, to come to you first. Okay, so, so but we will be getting yes, this out there. And if, and I, then could, the oh, go ahead, me, if I may clarify, yeah. some of these projects don't require us to come back. For instance, the, the, the CAD, the contract will come back to you for the CAD, yeah. but the money will go to the sheriff's office. The uh, administration, we won't come back to you. Anything that involves a contract, right. though, Understood. absolutely it will come back to you. And then, then there's a, maybe an update on the 501c3 program, and where are we with that? 
as Chris got this to me right in time for this meeting. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, have 19, about 19 five minutes, minutes into the meeting. <laughs> so, so we've been working on that. I actually had it confused on a couple of different because we had the, uh, the nonprofit grant program, um, but then this one was outstanding. We've been working with uh, the Community Foundation, the uh, Pinellas County Foundation, to administer this program. And so we, we're not completed with a contract yet, but that's the intent is to hopefully finalize that then to where they can administer this on our behalf. Uh, it'll still come back to you for decision making, um, but they are working with the nonprofits, make sure they get the paperwork in, make sure it complies with the, all the federal requirements, you know, and all, all of that type of stuff. Um, the idea is that, that this is going to come to you in, in June, at the end of June, and the day after you approve it, then we'll open the grant application up for a 30-day period, um, and then at that time, we'll have the criteria and everything that they'll evaluate against. We have to form a group that will make a recommendation to you. One of the things you had asked when we started this was that it's not just staff, that you involve members of the community, and so we'll come back to you with ideas at the June meeting for that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. All right, so are we ready to move this forward with a motion and a second? Yeah, oh, sure. move approval. That's what I thought. Oh, we do, so we yeah. just vote. Mm -hmm. All right, then are we done with discussion? Yes? Okay, then please open the board and let us prepare to vote. Okay, very good, thank you. Number 30. This resolution authorizing the county to exercise its option for a sewer um, revenue refunding note. So this will enable us to uh, take advantage of the lower interest rates. We locked this in back um, prior to us seeing some of the escalation. This produces about $500,000 in savings over the life of the bonds. Okay. Move second. approval. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second from Commissioner Peters. Any questions, comments, thoughts? No? All right, then please open the board and let's prepare to vote. All right, thank you. All right, 31, Barry. This amendment number one to the project cooperation agreement with uh, Corps of Engineers. Um, this is the federal participation on the projects listed. This is over, this is a, revises the total cost for the entire 50 year life of the program. So obviously very long looking, uh, but there's a requirement that we modify this periodically. Uh, Kelly is available if you have any questions. All right. What are the wishes of the board? Do we have? Move approval. We have a motion. Second. And we have a second from Commissioner Flowers. Do we have any questions or comments or discussion? No? Okay, then please open the board and let us prepare to vote. Thank you. And thank you, Kelly, for being here. All right, and that passes unanimously. Barry, 32. These are appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board. And uh, you have one appointment and many reappointments, or a couple of two appointments and many reappointments, and they're listed in your packet. Move approval. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Do we have any discussion? No? All right, then please open the board and let's prepare to vote. All right, that passes unanimously. <clears throat> Number 32. Item 33 is appointments. 33, I'm sorry. Appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee. Um, and again, these are um, several appointments and, and one reappointment. All right, are there approval. We have a motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? No. Uh, please open the board and let's prepare to vote. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. And now we are on 34. This resolution approves the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds by the Finance Authority, and this is for the multifamily residential rental housing project, Oakhurst Terrace. Uh, this will provide for 220 multifamily rental housing units. Move approval. Okay. Do we have a second? Hi, Mr. Fogarty. Do we have a second? Yeah. 
Second by Commissioner Seal. Uh, would you open the board, please, and allow us to vote? Thank you. Okay. And it passes unanimously. On to number 35. It's a resolution approving adjustments to the precinct lines for the supervisor of elections. All right. You may remember that Supervisor Marcus brought Move the approval. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? Questions? No? All right. Then please open the board and let us prepare to vote. Thank you. And that passes unanimously. Number 36. Madam County Attorney. Under item number 36, I'm asking that you approve the settlement and the reference case as set forth in the confidential memorandum that each of you had the opportunity to review. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and approved. Any discussion? No. Please open the board and let us prepare to vote. Thank you. And do you have any reports, Madam Attorney? <clears throat> um, yes, just uh, quickly, I would like to um, have you all vote on a couple of items that I handed out to you at the work session last week. Those were, as I explained more thoroughly last week, um, some letters rec representing multiple representation by the county attorney's office of the supervisor of elections and the clerk of court. You previously approved um, a conflict waiver for a law firm to represent the supervisor. These two letters relate to my staff in my office in order to provide ongoing routine legal services to those two officers, uh, which they have indicated they wish for us to do. So I would ask for you to uh, approve um, in an abundance of caution uh, that waiver for those two officers in regard to county attorney staff. All right. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Quick question. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, the second part of that I understood, their day-to-day -day responsibilities that you currently have. The first part, could you explain that again, the supervisor of election, what, that, that piece? Just that, that would be, the, that is the same. You previously approved a waiver for the law firm that was engaged by our supervisor um, related to litigation. This is kind of the... The corollary to that, which would be the conflict waiver for my own staff to continue providing routine services. Thank you. Okay, we have. A and when I say routine, I mean you know their regular ongoing support that's normally provided. Uh, okay, so we have a motion and a second. No further questions or comments. Would you please open the board and let us prepare to vote? Okay, thank you very much. And now we are. Anything else, madam? Yes, I would like to give you an update in regard to the litigation um, that you all are aware that we filed uh, related to Senate Bill 524. There was uh, multiple hearings held in Tallahassee yesterday. We had uh, multiple staff there in attendance. Um, I did indicate to you all in a memo I sent over the weekend that we were joined by Commissioner Long, who would have testified had we gotten to that point. Um, the judge did dismiss the case finding uh, that the supervisor of elections here is an indispensable party. However, he also found that the Secretary of State is also a proper party. Uh, that's a little, a little difficult, I think, to deal with these days, given some recent case law that provides that supervisors of elections are entitled to the home venue privilege. So when you have two proper parties, one of which is in Leon County and one of which is in Pinellas County, it's a little challenging, you know, to figure out how to deal with that. Um, I will say the case law related to supervisors is very new, so I don't know that that is an issue that, that anybody's had to deal with quite just yet. Um, one of the other findings the judge made was that he disagreed that the county was a proper party, but ironically did not dismiss the, the case with prejudice. So um, we were a little bit baffled as to how he could find that the county was not a proper party, but then also provide us with the opportunity to amend the lawsuit. Um, those two positions seemed a bit inconsistent to us, but nonetheless, that was the ruling. Um, we don't have a written order just yet. That's something that's being worked on between the parties, but um, we will see that shortly. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Concerns? Thoughts? No? Well, I would just like to commend the legal team that was in Tallahassee for this litigation. I was just totally um, amazed at the level of preparation and the incredible research that they had done and their ability to speak with the, 
with the judge referencing case law from, you know, over and over again in different kinds of um, cases. And so I was very, very impressed. They did an incredible job. And I'm very, very proud to have them working in our legal department. I'm sure you are as well, Jewel. And I've been thinking ever since about ways in which all of us could be a little more exposed to the folks in the legal department, especially there was the one litigator who was prepared to litigate the case that I had never met, and I just found him incredibly bright and just, um, I just cannot say enough good things about how well prepared they were. And we should all be very, very confident in their level of expertise. And I do think it's important to share, which you left out of your report, that last Friday, the clerk's part of that motion was dismissed as irrelevant. And so I know we've received quite a bit of emails right. about this whole entire thing. And obviously, folks are very misinformed about who uh, who has been doing what to who and who is paying for it. So I thought that that was important to clear up. So thank you. And sure. I'm very, very happy with your level of expertise as well. Your background and credentials surely shine through and I'm very proud to have you with us. Thank you. Well, I would, I would echo. I think our staff did a very good job. Um, I will tell you that uh, since this board voted to approve us moving forward, I've had the three attorneys that I know Commissioner Long dealt with largely, one of whom is sitting here today, um, having just driven back from Tallahassee this very morning, um, who have, have worked for you every day since you approved uh, us moving forward, including weekends and every night. Um, as you know, those are salaried employees who were just putting in extraordinary hours to represent the county in this regard. Um, you are correct, Commissioner Long, what I, what I did not mention it was the clerk's motion to intervene in the lawsuit in, in Leon County that, that was denied. Um, there remains a, a suit pending here in Pinellas County. Um, and I will say, you know, again, my staff that handled this, they just drove back from Tallahassee this morning. Um, I have asked them to take a deep breath. Um, they've been working very, very hard. And as far as taking a look at this case and what we might recommend to you all on how to handle it to Take some time to think about that rather than try to give you advice today in a reactive mode, mm -hmm. you know, to things that just happened yesterday. So um, we will be taking a hard look at that. Um, I will say that I think it is unrealistic to think that we would get any sort of um, different ruling from the court before the qualifying period begins. And, you know, there is case law in Florida that suggests that once an election begins, which would be qualifying, that courts are hesitant to interfere. Right. Um, so again, I do think it's unrealistic that we would see any sort of alternative outcome. Um, so you may very well find us seeing that, that we might recommend that this case be dismissed if that's the will of the board. But again, you know, we want to take a look when we're not fatigued <laughs> in, in reacting to, to something that just happened yesterday uh, to give you all some, some better informed thoughts. Thank you for that, uh, Madam Attorney. And I do uh, have a desire to share what would be almost comical <coughs> if it wasn't so serious, part of the judge's comments. So he indicated, and Don, you can correct me if I get any part of this wrong, but he indicated that the wording of the amendment that stuck what we all know to be a local bill into this general law was so poorly written that when he read it, he thought it didn't apply to Pinellas County. And in fact, he, he was waxing on about whether or not it applied to any county in the state of Florida. And then went on to say it was a very poorly written sentence. And so I was hoping he was gonna, he would stop at the end of, and it doesn't apply to any county in the state of Florida, <laughs> period, but he kept on talking. So uh, it was, I mean, it, right, it was odd. So anyway, just here we are. Yes. 
I just want to, again, say thank you so very much for going up and representing. Um, while it was not a unanimous decision, you still represented the county, um, not just, you know, specific individuals. And so I want to thank you for that. And I also um, want to say that um, at any given time, you know, there are 987,000 plus whatever people in the county. Um, but there will always be persons on both sides of the issue. So there are always taxpayers who support what it is that we may want to move forward. There are always taxpayers who may not want to support um, what's going on. Um, but I think um, what our attorneys did was move forward with factual um, uh, information and put together uh, the best causation that you felt was appropriate um, as it relates to um, the language um, that was in SB 524. Um, I also want to give super kudos to the staff we never really see, but you know they're working behind the scenes. And I um, just want to say to them um, that I do appreciate them as well, even though I don't know who they all are. Um, and thank you so much, Commissioner Long, for traveling up instead of Commissioner Justice and preparing yourself, even though you didn't get an opportunity to um, testify. Um, you still were there and you were present and you were available and ready. So thank you so very much. Well, thank, thank you. Me. Well, I have to say the debriefing with the attorneys was incredibly <laughs> intense. <laughs> I felt like I was on, you know, that... Uh, movie with Matthew McConaughey with they're, oh, they're always yeah, you know yeah. I, I mean it was like intense yeah. uh, but, you but you survived but you survived yes I you, did you, you. and you know of course they were somewhat chagrined after it was all over but I just thought it was an incredible learning opportunity and I did learn so much about what really goes on behind the scenes that you know, when you're involved in those things, you're on the front, and you don't ever see all the work that goes on. I just couldn't get over it. Really. And amazing. Um, the, the last thing I'm sure some of you have gotten them to, I've gotten a number of calls from the press. I've not given any statement or information I shared with them. There had been no debriefing, so I had nothing to share because I wasn't uh, aware of everything, even though, you know, other persons have put stuff out there. That's not the debriefing I'm looking for. I'm looking for what it is that our legal department, our legal team has to say. But I just wanted to share that um, I was really appreciative of the way that um, it has been handled, the way that our uh, attorneys handled it. And again, thank you very much, Commissioner Long, for well, setting aside your time also to go up and um, represent um, that point of view. Um, so thank you. Well, I know any one of you all would have done the same. So thank you very much. We are a team after all. Thank you. Thank you, Jewel. Um, okay, so now we are on to county administrator reports. Only one item. Several commissioners have asked me the status of Orange Station, uh, which is the um, old St. Pete police station. Um, and so if you recall back, you had asked about um, whether it was, what was the uh, analysis of the total site and all the dollars available. So economic development's been working on that and actually worked with our outside consultant to look at like rate of return, what the private market is, you know, predicted to be and, you know, by the time completion of the project. So they've kind of completed that piece. Um, we are going to bring that back for the June 21st meeting. Um, I actually asked them to do a little bit more because the parking garage is kind of shared. And so should that be included? So I want them to be available to answer your questions. If you include the parking garage, if you don't, it's actually used not only for an office building, right. but for residents and for the general community when it's paid for out of the CRA. So it's kind of, you know, some of that is kind of how you, which, which side of the ledger do you put it on to do the cost effectiveness analysis? So, but they're prepared for that. They'll put that on, but they had to, that was a lot of information to collect. And, and then I, I wanted them to engage on how a, um, how an investment committee would look at a project coming forward to where we can say that it truly is that but for, you know, but for this, you couldn't, you couldn't match that and that you're not putting too much uh, public dollars into a project. So again, I know that they, they've been calling many commissioners. We wanted to do our due diligence and response to the questions you ask, and we'll have that back for you here in June. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are under county commission reports, new business. Anybody? Commissioner.
Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, give an update. Some of you may have seen it in the paper where PSTA yet again um, has lowered its rates um, in an effort to help those individuals who may be struggling as a result of the increased uh, costs in gas. Um, and so uh, hopefully um, that will help some individuals, you know, continue to be able to travel to and from work. Um, my car is a six cylinder. I filled it up with gas the other day and it was $82. So, you know, that's a lot of money for, for certain individuals. Um, so anyway, just really uh, grateful and thankful um, for that. Um, career Source uh, is moving forward in um, the selection process for a new executive director. Um, we have selected the vendor to um, collect and interview those individuals or those applicants who are interested in that position. And we are hopeful that we will have those uh, narrowed down names soon so that the committee, the separate committee that's been formed to sit and interview those individuals um, will have an opportunity to do so. Um, I know a part of the process is, is that we would like to take um, each one of those finalists to the various career source facilities, let them meet staff and kind of have some one-on-one -on -one time. But I've also suggested that perhaps there also be an opportunity for the community partners to engage because they are also critical to the success of career source and how things happen there. So um, I am hopeful that we will um, be able to, to make that happen. But other than that, uh, things are going pretty smooth, so I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Some of the heavy lift stuff we've gotten behind us, and so we're just really focused on providing services to the client. So um, just wanted to share that piece. And um, then my last piece is a question. Um, I had a meeting with a represent, a, I'm sorry, a community person. They, we were talking about housing, of course, and he kept mentioning, well, I hear there's $3 million more million out there with the county, and I kept asking him, well, who are you hearing that from? Because if it was some more money for housing or housing supports, I, I would be, you know, supporting that. So um, does anyone know anything about that? <laughs> If we're, if we're talking about penny for Pinellas, mm -mm, uh, not penny money, because I, I, we talked intensely about penny, and I said, this is what we have, this is where we are, you know, persons are making application, we're spending the money faster than we thought, which is good, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we have some applications. People are making applications to be able to utilize those funds. Where did he get the info? From? I have no idea, and I did ask, and of course he wouldn't share. So I did say I would. You know, I said, I have a meeting on Tuesday. I'm going to just say maybe um, I missed something. Sometimes I am aloof. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I can certainly follow up with Bruce, Bu Bruce Bussey. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, they're constantly looking to see if there are additional federal funds. Um, right. But not that I'm aware of. Right. I, d I just, you know, I didn't think so. And from what I have, and I've been trying to keep my pulse on that, of course, because that's just a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask in case I... Um, I was asleep at the wheel one day about something. Um, so that's that's all I have. Um, of course, attending my committee meetings as assigned. Um, PSTA meeting is tomorrow. T. Barter meeting is coming up on Friday where we'll be um, uh, hopefully uh, voting on a couple of really critical things. And um, I'm excited that Commissioner Long did request that the um, Executive Di Director of T. Barter make some visits to various municipalities to talk about what it is that we're doing. And the county partners. And, mm -hmm, um, what it, yes, and what, what it is that we're doing. Um, and um, I've had conversations with him in just my one-on-one -on -one briefings, and he's already made um, contact with several of them. I think the city of St. Pete is saying they really don't need a... A presentation, not because they don't want one, but just because they're in, you know, they don't have a problem with what's being asked as it relates to their um, request for financial partnership. But um, he's he's been making those rounds, and I have offered to attend when available also to go and just have a, you know, a board member there present also to talk from that perspective as the um, uh, treasurer of uh, T. Barter um, as an officer. So that's all I have, madam. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Peters, do you have any no. Commission business? No. Commissioner Eggers. No, the only thing I wanted to say is uh, just a condolences to the family who lost um, son um, 
uh, to uh, fatality off of Madeira Beach and Johns Pass. Um, I had the opportunity to go down and spend some time with Mayor Hendricks on Saturday. Um, I could hear in his voice that he was, you know, again, having a difficult time with it. So we spent some time there and, and then went out and walked the area because I really haven't had a chance to walk that area. And the issues that not only are there for the dredging issues that we've talked about before, but the, 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 how the, the, all the currents move out there and the, and the really short jetty that doesn't help anything as far as you know, the sand movement and all that. It just, it's a very complicated issue, and I know that uh, there's been some work done on it. I'd really like, I was going to talk to you very offline about that just to kind of get up to speed on, on some of that. But um, anyway, just condolences to the family, and I know it was a tough day and tough week for the, for the city and for the council members down there and the mayor. Well, so that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Um, I'm curious, since you were recently down there, and I haven't walked around down there for a couple months, but were there signs up or were there, you know, those mm -hmm. um, yeah. areas that they put up in a dangerous area? No, it's, it's interesting. And beware when I, and yeah. all that kind one of, of thing. It was interesting because one, one of the folks that fishes there almost daily, uh, came up and saw us talking and so offered her comments and suggestions and said that really two things immediately we need more signage out on the beach itself because folks you don't realize before you know it you've gotten so close to this jetty that doesn't stick out beyond the beach really you're there and all of a sudden you're into these currents that's, and deep that's water. an issue yeah and so so bigger signs I mean the size of the sign was about the size of that so doing that and then providing some um, some, cause they, she said that they've actually helped get people out of the water when they're in trouble there. So just have some kind of device that's there and available that they could throw to somebody. Um, and, and so anyway, he's got, he, he took those suggestions and was going to look into that <coughs> part of it. But yeah, it, it doesn't seem like there's enough notification there, and they're going to be working on that. Um, so. All right, uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, just a real brief report on Forward Pinellas. Um, they approved the Unified Planning Work Program for Fiscal 23-24, the Sunrunner Rising Development Study, and three amendments to the countywide plan that'll probably end up coming to us next. Um, I would also like to note, it's kind of interesting, I just got an email from somebody, um, so they did the Pinellas Trail Speed Study and presented that and talked about the electric bikes, mm -hmm. um, but I still think that is going to be I think that's an issue that we need to talk about since it's our trail at some point because I do think that they are dangerous, <clears throat> especially with pedestrians and regular bikes and, you know, trying to keep everybody safe. So um, at some point I think it would be a good item for us to discuss. I would agree with that. Yeah. Roll rollerbladers, too, get hurt. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. and. I didn't think it was supposed to be for you. Um, I know, I know from experience that the rollerbladers, the speed racers, I mean, are going faster than the bikes. Mm -hmm. Just unbelievable. I myself used to rollerblade. I did too. And I could <laughs> beat almost anybody on a bike, mm. but not anymore. Anyway, um, okay, I have a couple things. If that's all right. Barry, I'd like to know if you could could give us, um, doesn't have to be in depth, but let us know where are we since I've had several communications and questions from the press as well as some citizens on our ferry, Cross Bay Ferry issue. First meeting with the group, I believe, and Jill's attending that is, don't hold me to this, I think it's next week. If it's not next week, it's the following week. But okay, it's that's up probably an unfair question considering Jill isn't sitting here. But I would like to uh, ask if we could make sure that the staff, our staff, lets the other folks that are involved in these conversations know that, you know, we had this discussion, Commissioner Peters made note of it as well, Last year, when we originally got started this whole process, and so for them to be putting out there in the public domain 
that we want to get out of the contract and we are not good partners just really lights my mm -hmm. views. Well, and I think so that's just yeah. not correct. It's right. wrong. Mm -hmm. And we want to be willing partners, but the key is we want a seat at the table. Isn't that right? That's correct. That's the reason we're opening these negotiations and Thank you. Um, and starting from scratch, you know. And so putting everything on the table and we'll all be there and we'll all be partners in this. Um, but yes, I mean, there's no question. You received a lot of emails and stuff because that's the typical way in which you push people to look at the at what people want and not the details of a contract. And so the contract details get lost um, because of the political pressure. Right. And so that was their intent. That's what they've done for a couple of years. Each not time nice. this contract comes forward, and the reason that we want to get to the table um, and really negotiate a contract. Okay, thank you. And then uh, lastly, I have a couple of items on behalf of our beloved chair and would like to bring up the uh, three different resolutions that he would like us to move for approval on. And the first one is supporting the uh, F dots lighting of the Graham Sunshine Skyway Bridge in recognition of World MS Day on May 30th. And the second one is World Fragile X Awareness Day coming up on July 22nd, 2022. And if any of you are wondering, as I did, what World Fragile X Awareness Day is. Mm -hmm. I have been <clears throat> informed. Does anybody else know? Because no I idea. That's what was going to be my question. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for saying that because I wondered what on earth I had missed. But it's a children's health issue. And um, it's a resolution in regard to children's well-being. And I can't imagine that we wouldn't be supportive of that, but I'm sure when Commissioner Justice comes back, he'll have a little more information for us on that if we so wish. But it just sounds like a lovely thing to move forward. So with that said, may I have a motion? Uh, move approval. Okay, second. 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 Karen. Yes, Commissioner Seal, I was looking at you to see if you had any comments, <laughs> questions, or thoughts. Second. What? I said second. Yeah, I know you did. Is there any discussion? No? Yeah, it just says here that the, it says most common inherited single gene cause of autism, fragile X, is the best key we have to solving autism. Look at that. So, anyway, this. You are so smart. Well, I just came up with Eggers. that off the top of my head. On, no, I didn't. <laughs> it's right here on the my okay. little trusty thing. So, so anyway. could you open the machine and let us vote on that, please? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm waiting, trying to get there. Give me a minute. I'm a yes. There we go. Okay. And if there's nothing else. There is can... one other thing. Oh, I'm so sorry, Commissioner Seal. Oh, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you to Jan Tracy and um, congratulate her on her 20th anniversary with the Pinellas County. And she's my commissioner's aid and she formerly was with solid waste so oh congratulations oh, excellent. congratulations, congratulations jan. jan that's a great accomplishment will she get a second another diamond in her pen <laughs> fake <laughs> <laughs> oh you mean it's not real <laughs> Aww. okay thank you you're welcome and i apologize for overlooking you oh you didn't overlook me okay thank you Barry. Um, just because we'll do this under the public hearing portion item, we're going to ask that item 44 and 45 be pulled. They, they didn't advertise it correctly, so they'll need to um, advertise that and resubmit this. I just didn't, um, we didn't want, if somebody wanted to comment on those items waiting, because we, we're going to not act 44 on. 44 and 45? Correct. Okay. So if anybody's waiting to make public comment on those, they don't need to. We won't be acting on those tonight. Okay, thank you very much. And do you want me to say that again during the, when the public hearing starts? Yes, at, at 44 that time. and 45. Correct. Okay. And the meeting with, the, uh, with uh, our partners, the first meeting on the ferry is actually tomorrow, so. Excellent, very good. Okay, look, I get to use it. There's nothing else, we are adjourned until six o'clock. Oh.
I would like to bring this public hearing, <coughs> excuse me, of May 24th to order. Uh, and without further ado, oh, we have two items that we're not going to be hearing tonight. Is that correct, Barry? Correct. So we need to pull items 44 and 45 from the agenda. All right. So if there's anyone here for 44 or 45, uh, we will not be taking those up this evening. Okay. First public hearing is on item number 40. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, would you like me to begin? I'm sorry. Would you like me to begin, Madam Chair? Yes, yes. please. Go ahead. Okay. Agenda item number 40 is a proposed Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act resolution for issuance by the Pinellas County Educational Facilities Authority of its revenue bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $5 million on behalf of Academy Da Vinci Charter School Incorporated. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of website posting has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <coughs> I have one um, card for Robert Szymanski. Robert, are you here? Yes, there you are. Hi. Come forward. Yes, please come forward and give your name again and sure. your address please and Robert Szymanski 1649 Ridgetop Way Clearwater Florida 33765 I am the uh, director for Academy Da Vinci and the treasurer uh, we sought to seek financing to refinance the uh, property that we acquired um, we're going to have additional hundred thousand dollars in cash flow by getting a better interest rate and that's what we did requiring your approval Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Move approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second for approval. Uh, could you unlock the machine, please? And public comment. Did you want any public comment? Well, we only had the one. Only the one card. Okay. I'm sorry. Just give me one second here. Thank you, Donna. It's coming. <laughs> there we go. All right, and that passes unanimously. And now we are on item 41, Madam Chair. Yes, I know. I don't know <laughs> what's going on with my. Sorry. Do you, you want to you check on the other one? Okay. 43. Yeah, 40. And oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I went about back and I did not. Um, Madam Chair, yes. I just want to check quickly before we get into the other two items. If there are any, if there's anybody here on item number 43. On item number. Anybody sign up, Barbara? No. 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 Okay. Then we can then we can take it in order. I mean, there's since there's no one here, I just didn't want to. We uh, didn't want to hold people. Commission, yeah, Commissioner Edgar suggested we not hold people up. Uh, because that's um we could I, go to I, 43 what we, we, could, we could go to 43 yeah why don't we do 43 yeah. you want to do 43 all right then we're going to jump to 43 oh. okay. Okay. agenda item 43 is case number zon 22-01 this is an application of christopher <coughs> lycia for a zoning change <coughs> from r3 single fit family residential to general commercial and services regarding approximately 0 0.09 acre located at 5659 66th Way North in West Leoman. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, signify by saying, I do? The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Glenn, do you, do you want to come up and 
Only, only if there's a need for a presentation. Do we, have, do we need a presentation? Mm -hmm. We don't need a presentation. Um, do we have any? And this is the applicant. So. Okay. You're the applicant, I believe. All right. Any questions, comments? Nobody has? No? No, no problem. All right, then we can have close, the, close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Move approval. Second. Any questions, discussion? No? All right, then could you please open the board and prepare to vote? There we go. And that passes unanimously. That was easy. That was Good. easy. Thank you for coming. I was coming. about to say, if you don't have to speak, don't keep trying to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Good evening. All right, and now we are back on 41. Yes. Yes. All right. Agenda item number 41 is case number FLU-21-06 and is the first of two public hearings to consider a proposed ordinance amending the Pinellas County future land use map. This is a request by Salamander Innisbrook LLC for a land use designation change from recreation open space, residential suburban, and residential low medium to residential low, and from residential estate residential suburban and residential low medium to recreation open space regarding approximately 64.1 acres located at 36750 U.S. Highway 19 North in Palm Harbor. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Six emails in opposition and two letters expressing concerns have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Right. <coughs> All right. We have several uh, citizens who wish to speak to this item. Cin Cin Cindy Tarapani. Okay. We're going to have a presentation. Presentation first. Pre presentation uh, first. I'm sorry? I'm the applicant. Okay. Uh, do we want to have a presentation yeah. on this yes. on? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Scott Swearingen. I am with the planning division, long range planning manager for the county. It's a pleasure to be with you and I appreciate your time. Scott. Thank you. The volume just. Oh, pardon, pardon yeah. me. Bring your mics in a little bit. Maybe that'll help as well. Okay. There you go. Hey, the case before you, FLU 21 6, is a, an amendment to the future land use map. Uh, the subject <coughs> property is the Innisbrook Resort at 36750 uh, US Highway 19 in Palm Harbor. The area being proposed for change is approximately 64.1 acres in size. This is a large scale amendment, so it requires two public hearings. Tonight is the transmittal public hearing. The proposal, approximately just <laughs> under 43 acres, a change from re recreation open space, uh, residential suburban, and residential low medium to residential low. And then the balance of the change, the 21.27 acres remaining, would change from residential state, residential suburban, and residential low medium to recreation open space. And so that comprises a total of 64.1 acres to be changed. The zoning is RPD, residential plan development, and there are no changes proposed in the zoning. However, that zoning category uh, requires uh, a development master plan, a DMP, and so there are modifications being proposed to that master plan. That case is not before you this evening. If you should transmit this this to the state for um, you know the transmittal hearing it would come back to you for approval and then that's when the development master plan would come to you for approval as well because you would want to approve the land use before before um, the changes to development master plan uh, the development master plan however was heard by the LPA uh, last month and um, it was <coughs> it was recommended for approval um, unanimously So the area um, under question, the Innisbrook Development Master Plan, the Innisbrook Resort, covers approximately 845 acres of area. It was created in the late 60s, a gated golf resort in a residential community. There are approved on the master plan 2,305 residential units that were approved as part of this development. And of that, 1,876 1, residential units have been built already. So there are some entitlements for um, remaining residential uh, units that have not been built yet, that have already been approved per the master plan. 
It, the area primarily consists of four golf courses, four 18-hole golf courses, including clubhouses, you know, an ancillary type of recreation facilities like driving ranges, teaching facilities, tennis, racquetball, restaurants as well to support the facilities, convention center, uh, event type spaces, that kind of thing. The applicant is Salamander Innisbrook LLC. Um, and they're proposing to modify one of the four courses, the Osprey North course, uh, into what's called a short course, and then to build 180 of the remaining 429 units as well. So that's kind of the, the gist of it. Um, overall, just kind of put it in, in a nutshell, this requires a future land use map amendment and, of course, a development master plan modification. Uh, the amendment would allow for residential uses to be moved um, from other areas of the property where they're currently designated on the master plan to different areas through this uh, change in land use. And it would also change some of the residential land use areas to recreation open space. So those kind of going to residential low and then some areas going to recreation open space. It's kind of in a nutshell what you're seeing for you. Oops. So looking at the aerial, the aerial, the, that 845 acres um, is in red, and if you go to the very north, there's an area that's enclosed in a blue, and that is a new proposed parcel L that would be designated on the master plan. And then within that parcel L are some of the land use changes, which I'll go over in just a moment. So I'm going to walk through this um, a little bit slowly because there's a few things going on here. But if you look to the north of the property, you can see outlined in red, that is parcel L. And you can see that it's designated uh, residential suburban, a little bit of it, uh, recreation open space, and then residential low medium. And if we can just real quickly go over to the right side, which is the proposed land use, and just kind of focus on parcel L, certain pieces of parcel L will be changed uh, to residential low and also to recreation open space. So those are really kind of the areas of change within the overall parcel L. And if we go back to the current future land use, you can see from midway on the property all the way to the south, there are five areas, uh, five residentially designated areas that are being proposed to be changed. And going to the right, you can see to recreation open space. So that's really all the areas comprised in that change. Some site photos. Um, the top of your slide is kind of north, northeast. You can see Klosterman Road, which is uh, to the north end. And there you can make out kind of two office buildings and some parking area as a part of the northeast corner of Parcel L, which is proposed for, is one of the two areas proposed for townhomes. This is the northwest area of Parcel L, and you can see it's adjacent to the Klosterman Oaks subdivision to the north. And there's another small area just to the south of that that's proposed for townhomes as well. That's the second townhome area. This is where the current Inverness Hall uh, Conference Center is located. It's kind of <coughs> southwest part of Parcel L. Um, and this is an area that is being proposed for the location of single family homes. This convention center and associated parking and whatnot would be removed. This is more towards the far back of the property? It's going to the southwest of the property, right. mm -hmm. correct. Okay. <coughs> Some of the, a couple shots of that Osprey North course, you can see a couple of different areas. This is kind of the northwest area of the course again. That was southwest of Parcel L, right? Yes, southwest, the southwest portion of Parcel L. Okay, yes. okay. thank you. Yes, sir. So just a couple shots to give you a flavor of the Osprey North uh, course there, kind of in the northwest um, part, of the, part of the property, part of Parcel L that would be. This is the northeast area, Parcel L, where I showed you those two office buildings and the ancillary parking area. This area is actually currently designated as recreation open space, but it's just kind of being used for like ancillary buildings um, to support the resort and uh, parking area as well. And then the Inverness Hall parking area. So the changes to the residential low designation are necessary to support the transfer of the entitled units to the new Parcel L. And then changes from residential designations elsewhere in a property, uh, parcels B, D, E, G, and H, are being changed to recreation open space to help offset the reduction of the recreation open space area, of the net loss of recreation open space per the proposal. And so there's really kind of um, three main changes happening. Two of them are happening on parcel L, 
and then the other happening on the, happening on the five other parcels that I pointed out in the central and south part of uh, the resort. So four of the sub parcels on L are going to residential low from various uh, land use categories, land use designations, and that comprises about 42.8 uh, acres. And then also on parcel L, you have residential land use categories that are being um, or designations that are being changed to recreation open space, and that's about 4.6 <coughs> acres. And then on the remaining parcels, kind of the third component of this, you have various residential land use designations that are being changed to recreation open space for about 16.61 acres. So in total, 42.8 such acres going to residential low and about 21.27 acres going to recreation open space throughout the resort. Real quick, on the, yes, uh, back to number thir page 13, um, which of those L1, L3, L4, L5 was the ancillary buildings that was, uh, it's designated residential, mm -hmm. uh, uh, excuse me, ROS, but it's, I just was wondering which. I believe that is L5, and I can ask L5, uh, okay. the applicant to be more specific on how those subparcels break out. So five acres there that are for recreation open space but not being used that way. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Pertaining to our comprehensive plan, um, certain policies come into play with this application. Uh, one <coughs> pertains to the coastal high hazard area, specifically in the coastal management element. Policy 1.3.5 states that the county shall not redesignate a land use to a property in the CHHA that would be greater than, that would permit more than five dwelling units per acre. Currently, we have an RLM designation that permits up to 10 units per acre within the CHHA area. And as part of this, it is proposed to be changed to RL, which would bring it down to that not to exceed five dwelling units <coughs> to be consistent with the policy that's in place. <coughs> Um, and to note, important to note, there are no new um, residential um, entitlements being proposed. This is all um, res residual residential permitted units that are being moved from one area to another. So there's no additional residential being brought into Innisbrook that was not already permitted per the development master plan. So all the units are accounted for. Also, there is a small portion of parcel L that is proposed for residential units where the CHHA kind of winds in a little bit. And again, and that is the area that was currently designated as RLM, permitting up to 10 units per acre, and that would be changed to RL um, up to five units per acre. There is also an access drive, and I'll show you an aerial in just a moment, that crosses the coastal high hazard area to access a cluster of townhomes, one of the two clusters. And because of, because of this policy, because of the coastal high hazard area issues, uh, the applicant is committing to various mitigation measures to offset the impacts to the development master plan, such as uh, roadway, the roadways being designed you know, to, to meet the current BFE and to maintain existing drainage patterns to culvert uh, where necessary so that in order to keep the, the current drainage flow and the drainage patterns. Okay, and let me unpack this area a little bit for you or kind of an aerial. So in the orange cross hatch is the area that is proposed for residential. The black hatch pattern um, with the light black line is area that is within the coastal high hazard area. And I wish I had a pointer, but this doesn't point. Nope. So there's an, the air, there's an area where the access drive crosses. It's to, the, it's to the north where you can see the coastal high hazard area going into that what looks like more like a pink area. So there's a sliver of property where the access drive crosses. And you can see more to the southwest where you can see that orange residential hatch pattern and you can see some of the coastal high hazard area that comes into what, what's likely to be some of the backyards into the back area of, of that part of the residential that would be proposed. Also in our comprehensive plan, um, we have policy regarding recreation open space area. So the recreation open space and cultural element, specifically objective 1.5, prohibits the conversion of dedicated <coughs> recreation open space and then encourages retention of non-dedicated recreation open space areas. 
important to note, there are no non-dedicated recreation open space areas within, within Innisbrook or within this proposal. Uh, the Innisbrook recreation and open sp space area reduction, so let me back up. Approximately about 73% of the total 845 acres of the Innisbrook Development Master Plan is re recreation open space. And under this proposal, that reduction, it would take that number down about 1%. So instead of 73% of the area being recreation open space, the proposal would have it reduced to 72% of the total Innisbrook resort area. That's how much of a, of a loss in recreation. But it's all non-dedicated. All non-dedicated. I yes, thought sir. you said dedicated. I'm sorry. No, sir. There's no dedicated. not. Okay. That was confusing. I'm sorry. No, no. It's, it's all dedicated. That yeah. It's all dedicated. That would be reduced. There is no. Uh, I'm, pardon me. There is no dedicated. It's the, all. It's all non-dedicated. Yes. All non-dedicated. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Make sure I was clear on that. Thank yeah. you. Pardon me. And that area is it's primarily golf course some of the ancillary office buildings that support the resort, and a parking area is, is what is comprised in that recreation open space that would be going to residential. Also, all this area, um, this recreation area, is it's internal to Innisbrook, and it's a private gated area. It's accessible to the folks um, in Innisbrook and those who are utilizing Innisbrook. It's not necessarily um, to the greater public of Pinellas County, um, accessible recreation open space area. It's, re it's really internal to that resort. And so the net reduction in rec open space would be 11.3 acres. Again, non-dedicated, <laughs> thank you, uh, recreation open space land, um, including golf courses, as I said, the ancillary buildings, parking areas um, that have already been established on those rec open space dedicated areas. They've just been built up like that over the years. And the area proposed to be designated as residential low, um, again, it just includes kind of, the, it's the transfer of where units were um, designated elsewhere on the master plan and being redesignated to this parcel L. And then those areas where they were designated are going to recreation open space for being changed. So it's just kind of moving units from one area of the resort to the other. However, it does require a future land use map amendment in order to do so. All four <coughs> golf courses uh, would remain uh, with this proposal, um, just the reduction in size to one of the four golf courses. And I know the applicant is interested in, in um, explaining why and, and what that's all about and how that works. And then as I mentioned, there are, through the development master plan, the applicant is committed to various mitigation measures to help offset some of these impacts. There was a traffic impact study prepared and the, impact, the results of that impact sh study showed minimal impact on surrounding public roadways. Um, there, as far as land use compatibility, we've got residential and institutional land uses uh, to the north and northwest of parcel L, and residential <coughs> suburban and residential low land uses um, designations kind of on the adja directly adjacent uh, to parcel L, mostly to the north. Um, there are buffer areas in place along the north property line that aren't designated as recreation open space, but a part of this proposal, they would be designated as recreation open space. So they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be residential and able to develop with residential at a later time. Staff finds the proposed land use amendments compatible with surrounding uses and consistent with the comprehensive plan with minimal impacts. The Development Review Committee staff recommended approval, as did the local planning agency with unanimous vote uh, back in June, or back in April, thank you. Uh, tonight, again, uh, this is a transmittal hearing. It's the first of two public hearings, so we're not, um, there's no real vote for approval or denial. It's just a decision to transmit to state and regional agencies for their statutory review of the proposal. And then again, that development master plan hearing would take place if this were to come back to you for an adoption hearing. It would take place at that time, and then you would be able to see um, in your agenda packets um, all of the commitments that were, <coughs> that were um, all the items that were committed to to be included in the development master plan in order to mitigate impacts. That concludes my presentation. Questions? Commissioner Rodgers. Yeah, just go real quickly to uh, page, uh, page 18, if you could. I just wanted to make sure. Not, not, not trying to uh, get into site plan work, sure. but just you introduced this 
page and um, you, sh you showed it crosshatch orange again that is the develop that's a proposed development areas that is the that is area where residential land use would be would be designated on the property okay so and that includes that little area all by itself up there in the in the northwest the north yes sir west. what is the solid orange there again what is that the solid orange um, it, that is area that is designated currently as residential low medium, and that is the, th those are the areas that have the up to 10 dwelling units per acre permissibility for the future land use map. But not what's being proposed here. No, in fact, um, the residential low medium is proposed to be changed to a lower category residential low, which would permit it up to the five dwelling units per acre. And that seems to be the one area where we have a lot of interaction with another community. Um, I mean, the rest of it seems to be kind of inwardly focused or public, you know, right of way or a large church. Actually, Commissioner, um, let me correct that. If you look at the southwest portion of it where you yeah. see that the orange, that is a residential low medium that is being changed to residential low. And then that part, that little square <coughs> in kind of the northwest, that's actually residential suburban, which would be changed to residential low. So what, and, and what's being planned to be built there? And that is, that is uh, townhomes is what the applicant townhomes. would like to build in that area. With setbacks and barriers we're talking yes, about. Yes, they are proposing, it's, um, again, there's, um, there's buffer area currently to the north, and I believe, and they'll have to speak to this better than I could, um, and additional discussions with the neighbors and with the community, um, they are agreeing to increase um, the distance of that, of that buffer area even further and to do additional plantings. Okay. But I would let them... That's that all for that's now. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else over here? Commissioner Peters, anything? Commissioner no? mm -hmm. Seal? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Ed Armstrong. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Hillward Henderson. We're located at 600 Cleveland Street, Suite uh, 800 in Clearwater. I represent Salamander Innisburg, which is the owner of the subject property. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I think your county staff did an exceptional job of walking through the, the many elements of the proposal before you tonight. <coughs> and we appreciate the opportunity to add to the information they provided, really focused on three things. One is uh, my client's vision for the use of the property should these amendments be approved by the Commission. Uh, we'd also like to explain to you the significant outreach efforts to um, our neighbors that we have made. And uh, finally, uh, a very tangible demonstration of our commitment to being a good neighbor is to show you a modification to our proposed master plan, which is not before you tonight, but we've made an adjustment there to, again, to be responsive to feedback we got during the outreach process. So we're on the clock. So with that, I'm going to ask Mike Williams to come forward. Mike is the Managing Director for Innisbrook, and he would like to address you about some of the things that I mentioned. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Williams. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you all. For 52 years, Innisbrook has been recognized as one of the premier golf destinations. Over those five decades, Innisbrook has been welcoming <coughs> members and guests from all over the world to Pinellas County. Innisbrook is one of the largest employers in northern Pinellas County, and Innisbrook competes daily against the likes of golf resorts, Doral, Pebble Beach, Bandon Dunes, Kohler, Pinehurst, Hilton Head, Sawgrass. <laughs> Significant competitors. Under the ownership and guidance of Sheila Johnson and Salamander Hotels and Resorts for the last 15 years, Innisbrook has, has evolved as the business environment and especially the golf environment has changed. If there was a silver lining to COVID, it was the growth and the popularity of golf and the golf industry. Today, golfers are younger, have less time to play, and want, want to combine the game of golf as both entertainment and sport. 
They want it to be fun. Our competitors have responded to this change by adding the hottest new thing in premier golf experiences, the short course. A short course is not a nine hole par three. A short course today has no magic number of holes. It is a quick play, something that can be enjoyed in an hour or less. Golfers don't need to be proficient in the game to enjoy the experience. That's me. I would be me too. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a social event. They can do it with friends, they can do it solitary, but always they want to have fun doing it. Innisbrook currently offers 72 holes of championship golf on four courses. To improve our golfers' experience and expand our golf options, we will construct a 12-hole short course and a 9-hole pitch and putt course and a 3-hole practice loop and a 2-acre putting green and a Golf Institute instruction facility. Mm -hmm. This provides our members and our guests options never before available at Innisbrook. Doing so enables Innisbrook to accomplish something of vital importance. It allows Innisbrook to remain viable for another 52 years. Again, it allows Innisbrook to remain viable for another 52 years. It allows Innisbrook to provide jobs, drive tourism, generate tax revenue, and sustain a long history of community involvement. Since the late 80s, on an annual basis, Innisbrook has hosted a nationally televised PGA Tour <coughs> golf tournament, the Valspar Championship. The eyes of the golf worlds are on Innisbrook and Pinellas during that week. Last month, Innisbrook played host to the United States Women's National Clay Court Championships. Again, nationally televised on ESPN and on the Tennis Channel. Once again, putting the eyes of the tennis world on Innisbrook. Pinellas needs to be, excuse me, Pinellas needs Innisbrook to be and remain financially and fiscally strong and viable so events like these continue to place favorable focus on our area. These endeavors aren't inexpensive. Innisbrook has partnered with a nationally recognized, publicly traded luxury home builder, Toll Brothers. Toll Brothers has agreed to acquire 53 acres, roughly 53 acres of land within the resort to develop a residential neighborhood of 180 single family homes and townhomes. This family neighborhood will generate 180 new memberships for the resort and our efforts to build the new golf experience at Innisbrook is reimagined and funded in part with this neighborhood development. I want to, I, I want to make special note of this next section that I'm about to address. Communications with our neighbors and the constituencies of Innisbrook was very important to us from the outset. We knew that we had to have a community outreach program to stay ahead of the curve, to reduce rumors that always develop around these things, and to make sure we were transparent. We also felt it, it very important that we have regularly scheduled communications. As such, we've demonstrated a proactive outreach campaign with the Innisbrook Condo Association the Highlands of Innisbrook, the Promontory of Innisbrook, Tuscany of Innisbrook, and met with the residents of Klosterman Oak. We've hosted 16 various town halls, written updates, meetings, meals with our residents, with our members, and with our neighbors to keep people informed. Those 16 outreach touch points occurred over a 13-month period. We've been transparent, flexible, and forthcoming. If I could, 
How do I get this so that you all can see all of these dates and efforts? Is that able to put it up on the screen? Right on the seal. On the seal. On the seal. Where your hand is. Where your paper ah. is. There Anything. you go. No, turn it the other way. There you go. Now we can see it. Yep, now we can see. I point to this because this graphically depicts the dates mm -hmm. and the efforts that we made 16 different times over a 13 month period. Specifically with Clasterman Oaks, 18 separate emails between the Clasterman Oaks HOA Board of Directors, president between February and May. We had a full meeting with the HOA Board of Clasterman Oaks. <clears throat> we had a live presentation to the residents of Clasterman Oaks and then threw them a cocktail party afterwards. And we had a follow-up meeting with the Clasterman Oaks HOA president in response to resident concerns to, advi to advise them um, and review with them our plans that we had listened to them and we had increased the buffer zone. It is, in our eyes, we think we've done everything that we possibly could to be upfront, transparent, forthcoming, and, and keep people informed about what's going on. A question for you, that Clostrum yes, Oaks, is that the area just north of um, Parcel L? Is it the outside Ennisbrook? That Commissioner area? Eggers, it is. It's okay. right on that northern border. Okay, thank um, you. We have, um, there's six homes in Clostrum and Oaks that border up against okay. us. Thank you. So thank you all very much for your consideration of our application. <coughs> uh, we very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, Chairman Long and members of the County Commission. I'm Cindy Terrapani. Thank you so much for having us here tonight to discuss this important project to Pinellas County and, of course, to Salamander Innisbrook. I'm a planner with over 41 years of experience in Florida. Uh, most recently, in the last 17 years, I served as vice president of a, uh, for an uh, engineering consulting firm. In the last three years, I've been uh, the owner and sole proprietor of my own planning firm, consulting firm. As you heard tonight, Innisbrook Resort is one of the earliest RPDs in Pinellas County. It was originally approved in 1968 on, 100, excuse me, on 580 acres. Less than 10 years later, by 1976, Innisbrook expanded to its current size of 845 acres and has stayed that size since then. The original <laughs> concept of Innisbrook was a resort with the highest quality of recreational amenities, and it remains their goal to do that today. You've heard about the amenities that exist in addition to the golf courses, golf driving ranges, tournament tennis, a family pool, multiple pools within the condos, state-of-the-art fitness center, a spa and a wellness center, and four restaurants. Most importantly, since the creation of Innisbrook, the Innisbrook uh, Resort has constantly and consistently adapted to lifestyle changes over those 52 years. The construction of the apartments on condominiums on the US 19 frontage, development of the promontory on the southern, southern southwest section of the property, ongoing improvements every year uh, to the golf courses, pool facilities, and other recreation activities, an increased trend of full-time residents within Innisbrook, which is not the original intent, not the original goal, but it has changed over time, and as Mr. Williams mentioned, hosting the Valspar Championship. The application for the plan amendment you're hearing tonight and the development master plan that you'll be hearing later are directly related to that goal to continue to adapt to lifestyle changes. The short course is estimated to be made up of about 70 acres of the North Osprey course. The remaining 53 acres are proposed for Parcel L, where the development would go. As you've heard earlier, there are multiple plan categories on Parcel L today. They are all going to the residential low five unit per acre plan category. Uh, and we currently have densities between two and a half and up to 10 units an acre. So we are reducing those in some cases. There are numerous reasons why this plan amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The staff report and our land use narratives describe the justification of this plan amendment in great detail. And I'd like to summarize just a few of those reasons. First of all, the proposed development on parcel L is consistent with the residential low plan category of five units an acre. The proposed development is 4.2 units an acre, clearly consistent with that category. Secondly, the county staff, reports, staff report states the plan amendment is consistent with the coastal management element to limit development in the coastal storm area to five units an acre or less, 
Again, we are requesting the five unit per acre residential low plan category, again, consistent with that. This county staff report also states that the requested plan amendment is consistent with the coastal management element for another reason in the fact that we do not propose to increase density on the overall Innisbrook resort. As was stated earlier, there are 2,305 units approved on the project today. Some of those units have not been built. It is those, some of those units that will be moved to Parcel L um, to, uh, to allow the development of Parcel L. So no increase in the overall RPD in Innisbrook. <coughs> the fourth reason is it also important to note that the county's emergency management staff has no objections to this application for the reasons just discussed that we have no increase in density in the coastal storm area. In addition, the applicant has committed to conditions above and beyond current county regulations to address potential storm events and potential sea level rise. Although you have no regulations today with regard to sea level rise, we are voluntarily agreeing to the following measures. First, we will construct all habitable structures to two feet above the finished floor elevation where normally only one foot is required. That would address potential sea level rise. Secondly, all roads will be constructed at or above the county's base flood elevation. Third, the entrance road to the western townhouse area, which uh, Mr. Eggers and Mr. Swearinger were talking about, the entrance road is within the coastal high hazard area. And so that road uh, will uh, include cross culverts to allow drainage under the <coughs> road so that it will, will reduce any impacts with regard to that. The county staff has also confirmed that the plan amendment is consistent with the rec open space since there is no dedicated open space. Dedicated open space is that owned by the, a public entity, the county or a city or something like that. In this case, all of the open space within Innisbrook is owned by Salamander Innisbrook. So there is no dedicated open space within Innisbrook. But just to give you the numbers, which I think are quite startling in a good way, um, today, there's 618 acres of open space within Innisbrook out of the total 845 acre site. So it's phenomenally large, 73%. If the plan amendment is approved, it will still, the Innisbrook Resort will still have 71.5 or call it 72% open space on the entire project. I don't think there's any other RPD in the county that can make that claim. The proposed residential low category that we're asking for is the same category and the same five units per acre density as is found on the Klosterman Oaks neighborhood to the immediate north of the townhouses. Um, and that is a typical plan category in the properties to the north and west off-site off of, off of Innisbrook. So therefore, our plan amendment that we're requesting a residential low is consistent with the general area. And just to build on Mr. Williams' comments about the outreach um, to the uh, Klosterman Oaks, I'd just like to show you this. Uh, exhibit that will um, be incorporated. It's already been sent to the staff, but it will be incorporated in the um, RPD master plan. This area here are the proposed townhouses. This is the road we were speaking about that will have the cross culverts underneath. The yellow is the 10 foot setback on the townhouse property. The blue is a 20 foot natural and enhanced buffer again on the townhouse property. And then there's a 10 foot drainage easement. There's also a 10 foot rear yard setback for Klosterman Oaks Village. So when you add all those together, you have a 40-foot separation building to building, single-family residential to single-family residential. That's phenomenal. It's extremely <coughs> large and significant, and we think it's a great buffer. Access to Parcel L is via Klosterman Road and Belcher Road, and the applicant's traffic study have demonstrated that both roads have capacity for this project. All other utilities and facilities are available to the site, consistent with the county's requirements. We thank you very much for your consideration. The county staff has found this application consistent with the comprehensive plan, and the local planning agency voted unanimously to recommend it to you um, for approval. We respectfully request your vote of approval, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. Questions? Yeah, right now. Sorry? No? Not, thank you. not thank at you. the moment. <coughs> That concludes our presentation. I would ask to reserve our remaining time for rebuttal after we hear from the public. Thank, Thank you. you. That'll be four minutes and 32 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, next we're going to call up Mike Williams. He already came over. He already spoke. He, he did? He just, he was the. Okay. Yeah. Addie Clark. With the applicant as well. I'm sorry? sorry with the applicant as well. Okay. 
Marcus Green. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you all. State your address, please. 8461 125th Court in Seminole. Thank you. Okay. Um, I first moved to Pinellas County in 1983. I first played the Copperhead Golf Course in 1984. Um, I've been um, probably played it over 150 times at this point in my life, and I sure hope it stays there. Um, I also work for Truist Bank, um, and uh, we are a sponsor of the tournament, at, and Innisbrook is a customer of our firm. Um, I'm also the current chair of the EDC in St. Petersburg, and when we're looking at economic impact, you look at a PGA Tour tournament, the only one on the west coast of Florida, by the way, um, hosted here in our community at the resort, um, that definitely has a positive impact. Um, and so they do a lot in the community. I see Michael out and about all the time. Um, and we appreciate your support for the project that they're uh, undertaking with Toll Brothers and the improvements they're doing to the resort to keep it, as Mike <coughs> said, uh, impactful and competitive in a very competitive market. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Jan Stevenson. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Jan Stevenson, and um, I'm a member at Innisbrook. But your I also address, please, for the pardon? record. Your address for the record. My golf course address or my home address? Your home address for the for the record. One zero one two eight Hermosillo Drive, Newport Ritchie. Three four six five five. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually an owner operator of a golf course in Pinellas County in Palm Harbor. And I've owned it for about five years, and I lose about two hundred thousand a year because running golf courses is a very expensive property is a project, and that's why a lot of developers and owners are getting together to make twelve holes. But you think about Innisbrook; they have four championship golf courses, and I hate to think what their budget is because mine loses money, and theirs are fantastic. But the whole key is that to host a PGA Tour event. They really request a lot from it. A lot of money has to be put into the golf course. And to have a Valspar Championship and a PGA Tour event <coughs> in this area is huge. Not just for the money that it brings, but the prestige. When I say I own a golf course when I'm at any of the other resorts, and they go, well, where is Palm Harbor? And I go, it's around the corner from Innisbrook. And they go, oh, Copperhead, I know it well. <laughs> so it's really, really important to the area. And um, I know one thing that's really impressive is the National Golf Foundation, they give us stats as owners and as a PGA Tour players and designers. They give you the, the data of what is important in golf. And what they're finding is the younger players, they have two things that's a problem with them with golf. Number one, it's too hard. And I can attest to that because I've been playing 60 years and I still can't get it. <laughs> and number two, that it takes too long. So if we want the younger players to continue playing and the younger families to play, we need to have something else. So the fact that Innisbrook is prepared to put their money back into the amenity to make a short course. Short courses are so much fun that, and, it's, and it's more inclusive because now you can be a beginner, now you can be a kid, and you can all play from all the different tees and it's fun. You only need two or three clubs so you don't have to buy an expensive set of clubs. And also, they're also proposing a really beautiful short game area for members. And of course, an 18-hole putting course, which is really fun for the kids. And so you see all the things that they're prepared to do um, to put back the amenities. They're going to be, they're building pickleball courts, which I love. <laughs> and so they're doing everything they can to really help. Because I've been to all of these resorts around the world that, that Mr. Williams named. And they are fantastic. They are really current. They're very relevant. And these short courses are, is the new thing, and, it does, and it's not cheap. I know they're looking into new water technology, which is going to help the environment because um, it's actually going to mean that there's less chemicals going on the golf course and the runoff, the water's going to be a lot healthier and sanitized. So they're doing everything they can. Um, and it's actually ri ridiculously reasonable for what little <laughs> property they're asking to move because they're going to put a lot into the golf course. So I'm very supportive, and, and I hope you'll consider. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dan Matheson. Hello. Hello. Welcome. 
Thank you. I'm uh, a resident of Innisbrook, uh, Unit 2350-36750, U.S. Highway 19 North, uh, 34684. I'm a Canadian who has been coming down here uh, since 1998, and I've been a property owner at Innisbrook since 2005. I have, uh, I'm actually a public official. I'm finishing my fifth term, 20 years as mayor of my hometown in Ontario, and we've chosen to come down here each and every year with our young family back in 2005 and since then. Uh, because of the amenities that Innisbrook had to offer. And I can tell you as my children have grown up, they're now 23 and 20, uh, their time at uh, Innisbrook has been one where we've watched other families come and grow and ours has done that as well. And I think it's imperative for the future of the resort uh, that this type of development occurs so they can reinvest in what the future amenities that families and of course the traveling public, which is important to Pinellas County of course with tourism, uh, are looking for. I've been sitting on the board of the Lester's Advisory Committee for the last eight years. I'm actually the chair, but I'm not representing that group tonight. And we represent the 300 owners that are the rental properties uh, that are at Innisbrook. And I speak individually as someone who owns two units, one that's in the rental pool and one that's not, that uh, the reinvestment will help those property values and the income come back up. As you can imagine, uh, post-2008, we didn't have great returns for a while. And then we've had the last two years of COVID. And I think it's great that uh, the resort is looking at reinvesting in the amenities. Uh, three and a half years ago, those 300 condos were all renovated on average at about $28,000 a unit paid for by the owners. So we made a reinvestment and we're happy to see that Salamander and Innisbrook is prepared uh, to make a further reinvestment. It's also important because I think of the tourism value that it has, but the employment value. And we've got to know many of the families of the staff that work there over the years. And I know that for many of the people in Newport Ritchie, Holiday, Palm Harbor, uh, right down to Ozona and across into other parts of this area, they all work and live at Innisbrook and it's been become part of their family. And there are multi-generation employees there. So I think of it as really a, a convention center, but also more importantly, uh, a social agency in North Pinellas. It has the ability to bring people from around the world, but most importantly, it has the ability to continue to be a beacon, not only for professional golf or tennis, but for families to continue to vacation in and around this region. And I think it's a great investment and I appreciate your consideration of the request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brigid Hugh. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Hi, thanks. My name is Bridget Hugh. <laughs> yeah. um, I reside at 1246 Playmore Drive in Palm Harbor that's located in the highlands of Innisbrook. I uh, re relocated from Fort Myers, Florida about two years ago in, in July of 2020, right smack in the middle of COVID, mm. we decided to, <laughs> decided to come up here. We are thrilled with our purchase inside the highlands of Innisbrook. But we think that the reinvestment that Innisbrook is going to be making back into that community will help all of the property values like they have uh, been saying earlier, not just the condos, but our community as well. We're members, we're golf members. Um, I'm not quite a full golfer yet, so that short course will be very helpful to me. The practice course, the three-hole course, all of those. Um, those are a big attraction to individuals such as myself. Uh, when I was in Fort Myers, I was the regional vice president for Berkshire Hathaway. I was 35 years in the real estate industry, um, 15 years of that in that role for Southwest Florida. So I didn't get to play too much golf then. But now that I'm retired and I'm living up here, um, that is what I'm hoping to do. I want to continue to do it in Innisbrook. I want it to stay viable, like they have spoken about. Um, so from the golf course perspective, I, I think everything that they're doing to reinvest will help from the property values. From the real estate perspective, I do believe that we have an unmet need in northern Pinellas County and in Palm Harbor specifically for this type of product of what they're going to be building. We don't have too much new construction taking place. Buyers always <coughs> love new construction um, for attracting into the area here. Um, new construction as well as having new members into the community is going to be wonderful. But this particular type of product is something that we just don't have up here. Um, I have friends, I have family members that I'd like to get here, but we're missing that product to be in a golf course community, a gated golf course community that has these type of amenities. So I think that having the construction, having this type of property built, 
um, will be very good for the area. I think it'll be very good for Palm Harbor, for Pinellas County, of course, for Innisbrook. And us being in the highlands of Innisbrook, that's a more mature community there, but it will still help. Um, growth is good. It's, good. it's good for all of the communities around that. And the young families coming into there will be wonderful as well. So I hope that you all will consider that and, um, and approve this going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have John Haddon. Hello. Welcome. First off, yeah, thank you. My name is John Haddon, and I'm at 1536 Lavello Lane in the Promontory at Innisbrook. Thank you all for your service to our community. Um, you know, first I want to share with you what I'm not. I'm not an official. I am not on a board. I'm not on a committee at Innisbrook. I am... But what I am is a 45-year full-time resident of North Pinellas County. And when you're here that long, you've had the opportunity to see the impact and influence that Innisbrook has had, not only in our community, which we talk about North Pinellas, but it's really impacted South Pinellas, Northern Hillsboro, Southern Pasco. I mean, the draw is national from an attention perspective, but it also impacts a lot of the places that we live. Um, you know, and as long as I can remember, like I said, they've been a staple. Um, they've positively impacted gainful employment, the taxes that they've paid, and certainly will increase the tax base with 180 um, new residents. But what isn't discussed much about Innisbrook is the charitable giving, the scholarships that they provide year in and year out, not only to their own employees, but to those in the community. And I don't think that should, I think good deeds should always be recognized, so I wanted to pass that along. And, you know, the change that we're speaking of, in my mind, is really more of a transformation. Um, it allows for a sustainable business model. It cures a real estate need that is, that is out there. It ensures continued employment and career mapping at Innisbrook for hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and it modernizes and therefore enhances the golf and tennis experience. You may hear, um, and understandably so, that there will be traffic concerns. Um, six or seven years ago, when our neighborhood was built with 110 homes, the exact same concerns existed. And what really impacted was the community, the, the small businesses. And you can ask them because during COVID, and we get to know so many of them, the first thing they would say is, John, when is Innisbrook opening back up? This has really negatively impacted us. So, you know, it's, it's an important time for small businesses to flourish, to be sustainable. And um, prior to the pandemic, you know, Innisbrook would see upwards of a thousand cars a month. Um, and I don't know the exact number, but a thousand cars a month from convention travel that would come in. Well, we all probably know that conventions and large companies have really simmered in the last couple of years. And I don't know that they'll ever get back um, to, to where they were. The point in sharing that is this is a community and this is a town and this is a city that knows how to move traffic. So those thousand cars a month are no longer coming through the gates. What we would have is the advent of 100 and new 80 homes and families. So to me, it's a transition or a pivot. It's an appropriate decision, but that's for y'all to make. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Bill Lomaca. Hi there. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Bill Lomaca, 4859 Classroom and Oaks Boulevard. Um, the when Innisbrook spoke about the meetings that they held with their subdivision and uh, they were very informative the problem was the April meeting the what was missing was answers to our questions whenever we had a question about what type of wall was going to be construction constructed they didn't know what was the townhouse uh, townhouse going to look like we don't know what was the lighting going to look like? We don't know. What was the ground elevation going to be compared to the homes, that the six homes that it's going to back up to? We don't know. Everything we asked, they had no answers for. Yes, we had meetings, but when you don't get answers, you have no idea what's going to happen. And that was our biggest concern. And it also appears that the county is concerned about that as far as neighborhoods go, because in their goals, objectives, and policies, in paragraph 1.2.4, uh, 1 it says that recognizing successful neighborhoods are central to the quality of life in Pinellas County. 
redevelopment and urban infill development should be compatible with and support the integrity and viability of existing residential neighborhoods. We have a concern about that because when you're going to have, if that's going to get rezoned and you're going to have a 25, 30, 35 foot solid wall staring you in the face from your backyard full of windows, that's that's not meeting anything as far as the neighborhoods go. We love Innisbrook being next door. It'd be great if it could remain a golf course right behind us, but we know that's not going to happen, and that's fine. But we would prefer that it, if anything were to change, it wouldn't go to a townhouse that we were going to be looking right at because we are concerned about the property values along there. And that's that's kind of a major concern because we've already talked to some of the neighbors and it's bothering us a little bit. I'm not going to be directly affected, but I am concerned overall. I'm close enough, but I am concerned overall about the uh, the quality of the sub. We love the sub. And I'm assuming Innisbrook likes us next door because it's a quiet place. It's a great sub. We love living there. So please take into consideration the rezoning of, of that piece of uh, property. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly Cohn. Good evening. Hello. My name is Kimberly Mills Kuhn. I am a member at Innisbrook. And I'm voicing my support as a member because many of the changes that Mr. Williams spoke about my family can take direct advantage of. My six and nine year old are just learning to golf. They're already much better than I am <laughs> and getting as close as they can to my husband. But the, the practice course and the smaller course would be perfect for our busy lifestyle as well as our children as they grow and get more into the sport. As a born and raised, um, as I was born and raised in Tarpon Springs, I'm also expressing my support because I'm excited to see the increase in revenue, the increase in employment, and the increase in, in tourism that I think this project and the changes and the developments will bring not only to Tarpon Springs, but also to the community and to the county as a whole. So thank you so much for the time and also for your consideration. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank every, I'm grateful for all of you being here to voice your thoughts and your opinions. And did you have something, Commissioner Seal? No. no? Um, Mr. Armstrong, are you ready to come forward with your, since we don't have any questions? At <coughs> yes, sir. Nobody's called me yet. Mike Willie. Your name? Mike Willie. <coughs> did you, you filled out a blue card? Uh, yeah, you might have said Mike Williams twice. Oh, I bet that's what I did. I'm so sorry. I'm a little, I, I, okay, what do you see? Well, please come up. I don't certainly want to leave anyone out. I'm looking for you. Is this you? Oh, you may ask the tough questions, though. Yeah, they'll see, Willie. Is that you? That's me. Okay, I so apologize. Well, please. Hi, my name is Mike Willie. I'm at 4835 Clostam and Oaks Boulevard uh, in the Clostam and Oaks subdivision. Uh, and we do not like uh, the townhouses behind us. We live in a residential single family neighborhood. We, we oppose 20 foot barrier. They say 40 foot is 20 foot that we can put trees up. You're still gonna be able to see through it. It's not big enough. If we had enough of a barrier, like 50 foot of trees and bush, bushes, that would help at least make it look like a wooded area, but nobody wants to move, move from a golf course view uh, to, to look at any type of townhouses. Single family homes, they, they have a private road coming in. They could certainly put those townhouses up in front by the other townhouses off of Clostamon Road and put a nice single family residential area back there with a private road they could put a separate gate in. I don't know why they don't want to change their mind to do that. That would be more in line with what we're looking for um, and because uh, it affects us. Now, we also hear a lot from Inish Book that they're going to work with us to help build that barrier in between the trees, the bushes, the shrubs, whatever. But we get this, we don't get anything in writing. In order to put, if you put one tree, and I have, uh, I have actually a bid, if you put one tree or two bushes in every 10 square foot across that, that back area back there, it's almost $200,000 to have installed. We're not talking big trees, 12, 13 foot, and bushes starting at four or five foot so they have time to grow. 
but it's $200,000. I think if it's not in writing and it's not escrowed up, they're going to say, hey, well, we tried to work with you. Now you get nothing back there. So I'm concerned about that as well as it should be single family residence. I do not know why it's a townhouse backing up to a single family uh, resident area. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for speaking up when I overlooked you. It wasn't intentional. Okay, any, any questions, thoughts, anything at this point? No? Ed? <coughs> Give me just a second to get your time up. Just give her a second to get your time back up there. Sure, I don't think I'll need it all, but take as much time as you like. <laughs> nice to see you here. Good to see you here as well. There you go. There we go. Go ahead. Very good. Just, um, I would like to briefly address the remarks of the, the two folks from the public who came to speak. You know, after the first gentleman, in terms of some of the level of detail, step back and look at where we are. We're trying to amend the land use map on 50 acres. We haven't picked out the drapes of the homes that might go there yet. This is the first step in a very long, involved, detailed process. This is the first step. And candidly, we want to spend that bunch of time and money and effort engineering something unless we have a sense that this board is going to approve our map amendment. And then we know we can feel comfortable proceeding with the support of this board should you deem it um, appropriate. Uh, but that will come later in the process, and the public is, uh, as a point of entry into that process, we'll, we'll continue to welcome their input as we have the whole time. Um, with, re, with respect to the uh, second speaker, living in Clostroman Oaks, I would just note that the zoning in Clostroman Oaks has the, you know, a 10-foot rear setback. We're providing dramatically more than that. The height limit in the zoning district for Clauston and Oaks is 35 feet, the same in our RPD zoning district. So from a zoning standpoint, it's essentially the exact same thing. So from an expectation standpoint, um, apparently he doesn't like being adjacent to a residential use, but he in fact is a residential use himself. I mean, you step back and look at all the testimony presented by your staff, by our experts, we think we've carried the day and we think our application is worthy of your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are the wishes of the board? Do you mean about what is our uh, charge tonight is to, it's, uh, to well, for transmittal? This is your first public hearing, but I would recommend that you go ahead and take a vote to approve transmitting this to the mm -hmm. state. I'll move approval of transmitting it to the state. A second. So we have a second. We have a motion and a second to transmit this item to the state. Uh, do we have any discussion or questions? I just have a comment. Is There's a lot more process. This, this has to go to those residents that are concerned. There's a lot more process, and, and Mr. Armstrong was correct that to make that investment now on the engineering and the elevation and the um, architecture, it's, it's just too soon in the process. And since there's another public hearing, when they come back to us, then there's going to be a lot more detail if it goes through the next steps that it has to go through, there's going to have uh, numerous opportunities to talk about every one of those things that you addressed. Um, and so, you know, I, I just am in support of it and just know that this isn't the final stop and the things that you're concerned with, I recommend you work with Innisbrook and make sure that they meet your concerns because I do believe that they're in good faith um, in what they say. Well said, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, thank you for a short course because I can't even do one hole. Um, I was asked to leave a, a golf course <laughs> once, Twin Brooks in St. Pete. I was digging holes. So um, I, you probably don't want me even on your three-hole course. But um, I, first of all, I just want to say that um, I, I truly echo that's what I was going to say, that this is really just transmitting to look at a change in the land use. It is not to govern what happens architecturally. Um, I have to commend you guys on um, considering the reduction of the number of units because you could have, in fact, built, built the 10, which probably would have been more concern for the residents. Um, since you've heard their concerns, I sincerely hope that you will take that into serious consideration because that's a, a concern that we get a lot from these types of cases where um, they have once a very nice view and now they have 
a not so nice view, even if it is the backyard still, you know, you just, so I really do appreciate you all at least having those conversations. And I really hope that you will continue to have that dialogue and take that into consideration as you're moving um, through the uh, process. The only other thing I want to say is I've been to a number of events at Ennisbrook. They have been really good partners with South Pinellas County um, because uh, many of you know David Archie, his nonprofit. You guys have worked with him um, in the convention center portion. Um, I've been to a number of other events that have been there where you have partnered with the community um, to host events um, up there. Um, and then working with some other nonprofits where you've allowed them to utilize your golf course for a fundraiser type thing. Um, my sorority um, and fraternity um, of friends, the Omegas, have had golf things up there. So um, I would love to see any expansion that would allow for you all to remain and remain relevant because individuals are looking for features and amenities when they go places. Um, so I do support transmittal of this. That's only what, that's all that this is to the persons who have concerns. This is just transmitting it to the state for them to make the decision as to whether or not they agree with the request. And then that comes back to us. So there are several other steps as Commissioner Peters said so eloquently. Um, but I do thank you for coming and, and sharing your concerns and for, um, and I'm not just saying this, I don't think I've seen any um, processes come before us when you've, where they've had that many community meetings or touches. I haven't seen that many. So thank you for doing that. And I, I do believe you're operating in good faith. Just keep um, to your forefront kind of some of their concerns because they, you know, put yourself in their shoes and you probably looking for the same thing. So thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Anyone over here? Commissioner Eggers? <laughs> yeah, I would uh, echo a lot of the comments that were made by the folks that presented tonight. Um, and they touched on a lot of the pluses to the to Ennisbrook, uh, so a lot more eloquently than I will. Uh, I think the item of 73% versus just under 72% still being open space, still being descriptive of what Ennisbrook is physically. Uh, I think a lot of people spoke to what Ennisbrook means, not only for that area, but clearly for Pinellas County. Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, I'm very supportive of, of the request. I do think uh, that we do have some work to do. And I think hopefully in the next few weeks and month that you start to fill in some of those little details. And I understand the comment that, you know, some of those details will follow. But this is where the residents have a chance to voice a concern and hopefully have some additional addressing over the next two months or whatever length of time it takes to get back to us. So I hope that as you already have in good faith uh, addressed a lot of the concerns, now it's time to start maybe filling in some of those blanks um, and maybe even talk a little bit about height of townhomes versus height of single family homes. Sometimes they're not that different. And so um, just giving a sense of comfort to them as to how that little entryway and how that entryway goes around their development, I think is extremely important. So I'll be looking forward to hearing some of that when we come back to the next hearing. But um, just uh, good, good work overall. And thank you for those of you who came out to speak constructively against it, but you know, wanted to hear some more from the, from the developers. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for seeing anything. All right. Then what are the wishes of the board? Move We've on. already yeah, we made a motion. We, a we made a motion. We had a second. Would you like to unlock the board, please, and let us vote? There you go, and it passes unanimously. Oh. Thank you. Huh. Hey, hey, it's, it's not coming up. And I'm an eye. You're wrong. You're an eye? Uh-huh. Okay. No. So there you are. No, an eye, not a nay. I mean, yes. Because <laughs> I made the there motion. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for your participation tonight. Um, and now we are on to, we're on number 42. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, agenda item number 42 is case number ZON 21-11. <clears throat> this is a request by William J. and Joan Kimpton for a zoning change from residential agriculture to residential rural conditional overlay with the conditional overlay limiting the number of primary residential units 
to a maximum of two single family dwellings regarding approximately 2.12 acres located at 1645 Chaplain Court in unincorporated Dunedin. Since this is a quasi judicial <coughs> hearing, all those individuals who plan <coughs> to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying, I do. I do. Public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. 37 emails in opposition have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, do we have a presentation for this, Mr. We do. Uh, so, Glenn, if you'll come up and uh, he'll provide a staff presentation to begin the hearing. Thank you, Glenn. Good evening. Good evening, Glenn Bailey, Zoning Manager. This is um, case number ZON 2111. <laughs> In this case, the subject property is approximately 2.12 acres, located at 1645 Chaplain Court in unincorporated Dunedin. The request is a zoning atlas amendment from residential agriculture to residential rural with a conditional overlay. The main difference between those two districts is lot size. Uh, residential agriculture um, requires two acre minimum lot sizes. Residential rural requires 16,000 square foot minimum lot sizes. The uses are essentially the same, uh, mainly a residential use, single family residential use. By future land use, there's no change proposed. It's residential suburban, which allows up to 2.5 units per acre. The existing use, there's one single family home there. Proposed use is uh, two single family homes per the conditional overlay. He simply wants to build one more detached uh, single family home. Some background on this. Um, in January, the LPA heard this case and uh, they continued it for three months to their April date to provide the applicant an opportunity to pursue a conditional overlay to limit the number of residential units to address neighbor concerns or potential impacts of increased development. Other, without the overlay, the land use would allow up to five residential units. With a conditional overlay, he's limiting himself to only two. Uh, the resulting, again, that's basically what I said, it's uh, as allowed by residential uh, suburban land use category. Um, here's the location of the subject property. It is essentially surrounded by the city of Dunedin. It's an odd shape. It's a remnant area of residential agricultural zoning. Um, there's single family detached homes essentially in all sides. So the main roadway to the east is CR1. To give you perspective of where this is, Curly Road is to the north just off the screen and um, you see Michigan Boulevard there a bit to the south. This is only future land use. Again, you can see how it's surrounded by the city of Dunedin. All the areas in white without color is in the city limits of Dunedin. Um, you have some various areas of enclaves of unincorporated, mostly residential agriculture. Some are two single family residential. See again, the subject property is completely surrounded by the city of Dunedin. Here's more of an a, a oblique aerial. Let's give you a close up view of the subject property, which is outlined in red. You can see a single family home there and the surrounding single family home, single family neighborhood around the subject property. Uh, again, the applicant, you can see. Within the red outline, there is a, a lot line on the southwest corner there. Essentially, he wants to, he cannot build in that southwest corner because there's, there is drainage issues there. So he wants to move that lot to the northeast corner of the subject property where it's more appropriate for development. It's higher level. Uh, there's no um, drainage issues, there's no wetlands in that area. Uh, the R zone again requires 16,000 square foot minimum lots. The surrounding zoning is Dunedin's R100, which is a minimum uh, lot size of 10,000 square feet. So what he's requesting is still larger than that. Uh, there are 16 abutting lots to single uh, to, this, to the subject property. 12 of those are smaller than the R minimum lot size, 16,000 square feet. Again, the subject property is a remnant. All surrounding properties once had the same type of zoning as the subject property, and all have been annexed over the decades, developing the subdivisions and so forth. A, little, a few site photos is looking at such a property, the front of it from uh, Chaplain Court. And on the left is looking east along Chaplain Court, and on the right is looking north from the near subject site. Essentially, it's a lower density, single family detached neighborhood area there, and pretty much on all sides. Some additional information the potential future uses of the proposed RRCO would allow for two detached single family homes and accessory residential and personal agricultural uses. Uh, the accessory uses could be an accessory dwelling unit, a detached garage, things like that. 
again, again, the minimum lot size is larger than most surrounding residential properties, and the residential suburban land use will not change. And some additional information regarding the drainage concerns. There is an existing drainage issue on the west side of such a property. Uh, second, again, the second home is proposed on the opposite side of the property away from this area of concern. The applicant has expressed a willingness to work with neighbors to address the problem. And new home, com and just to be clear that new home construction is subject to land development code standards and required to go through the permitting process, which regulates drainage, so all this will be looked at. Uh, we do have an engineer from the county staff here to answer any drainage questions you might have. And a recommendation is that the proposed zoning idols amendment is consistent, it's compatible with the surrounding uses. It's actually still a uh, larger lot size than what's required in Dunedin, the surrounding Dunedin uh, properties. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan, the Development Review Committee staff recommended <coughs> approval, and the local planning agency recommended approval on a three <coughs> vote. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Unless there are drainage questions, then my colleague can answer those. Question. Commissioner Eckers. Yeah, could you, uh, just it's drainage related, so maybe okay. your colleague can come forward. This just seems, to, um, so just a, a sense of what the existing drainage issues are in that one western piece. Right. So. Uh, I'm Randy Ayers with Development Review Services Engineering. Hi, Randy. So the, uh, basically the topography has always drained from east to west. Right. Um, at some time back in 2010, the previous owner dug a depression in that one square. So that depression is actually providing more uh, retention. So it's decreasing what um, could be potentially worse flooding. So Did you say decreasing or increasing? It's, it's decreasing. It's like acting like a retention pond. Okay. So it's holding more water that would normally be continuing, continuing to flow to the west. So it's a good thing. Yes. Do we have um, standards um, in, with two homes like that? Do we have standards that would call for a retention pond, a real live retention pond? No, we wouldn't. Our stormwater manual um, for single-family residences, is uh, the threshold is 10,000 square feet. So it's typically pretty hard to get to 10,000 square feet, and that would just be um, treatment and attenuation. However, we've um, discussed that when some of the houses were built on the west end along Nigel's, it basically has kind of blocked some of the flow. So we could uh, consider it a closed depression at this point and um, require them to retain the increase of the 100-year storm. And I think Mr. Kempton has said that he may be amenable to that. So, that. so we basically can't really do a lot to alleviate the existing problems because those properties on the west side are in the city. And it's potential, it's, it's possible that when they, those houses were built, it kind of blocked the right. existing the flow. The natural flow. Yes. But we don't get into site plan work here. We don't get into, you know, site engineering, this kind of right. stuff. But, I mean, obviously it's been brought up, and it's what the concern of a lot of the residents are. And if you get out there and look at it, it's a, it's a big difference in the front uh, to the eastern piece of the property and the western piece. Yeah. It's quite the different. East is and much if higher. you're not going to provide that, that extra um, things that we don't require uh, in terms of drainage pond, it's, it is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and, uh, and during our review, we, we do review uh, single family residences, their grading plan, and we ensure that the um, flow is neither blocked nor diverted to the detriment <clears throat> of the neighbors. And swales, whatever's needed so that it doesn't discharge onto the neighbors. So, so the idea would be that the improved property with two new homes, if, presuming that the one comes out and two go in, would have Correct. to di direct, the on-site property would direct the drainage to this area that we're talking about, to this it, area to the would, west. It would continue to flow to the west, which right. is where it's going now. Right. Um, but they could um, <clears throat> have some depressions, additional depressions, to store the increase of the 100-year storm. But the new construction would divert the flows towards the west into that area that we're talking about that's accumulating water now? Yes. Okay, so you're not building it so that it's going to go off to the north and to the south. Correct. It's, it's not still, going, yes. It's, it's going still to naturally going to flow to the west. Yes, it's okay. going to maintain its flow direction. Okay. Okay. 
okay for now. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? All right. All right. We have a few cards here from people that would like to speak. Uh, the applicant. The applicant. Yes. Yeah. Did they Presentation. I have his card right oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Kempton. I'm sorry. Good evening. Good evening. I was going to say it's afternoon because I've been here a while, but that was a worthwhile case you had there earlier. Uh, my name is William Kempton. I have my wife Joan here with me. We live at 1645 Chaplain Court. I've got it written right here. And uh, we bought this about, uh, I guess, a year and a third ago after we sold our house on Clearwater Beach and succeeded with some inflation there and transferred it over here. Um, I didn't know when we bought it that it was zoned uh, for one house for two acres. I honestly had never heard of anything like that uh, in the area, but that proved to be the case. And when we started out, we went to the city of Dunedin, which surrounds us, and said, we think we'd like to annex, and uh, what do we need to do? And they called a meeting, and, you know, typical same thing in the county. You have a meeting with all the different people there. <laughs> And uh, they say, we'd be happy to annex you, um, but you have a problem, and that is you don't have any street frontage. Uh, if you can see, can you see in this? Yeah. Yeah, our street right here, uh, County Road 1 is right over here. You come in here, you come in this two-house section here, one house here, and you saw the entrance and a couple of pillars, and you can come into this property. And uh, when we saw it, we immediately fell in love with it. It's a fantastic piece of property. And uh, so we thought, well, Dunedin's got all the utilities all the way around us. Let's go talk to them. So back to that meeting I was talking about, the problem is we don't have any street frontage. The entrance comes right into the property here, and there's another access over on the side. Um, neither one of them have any street frontage. So Dunedin told us that uh, after we annex you and you're part of the city, then you're going to have to get a variance to be able to do anything because um, you don't have any street frontage. And we require that. So I said, well, what happens if you don't grant the variance? Because I'm a real estate lawyer, and I've had a lot of variance experiences with a lot of the cities and county, and uh, a lot of them with Dunedin. And some have worked out well, and some have not worked out well at all. And so I said, well, what happens if you don't grant it? And they said, well, then, whatever you want to do, every time you want to do something, you'll be nonconforming, and you have to come get another variance from us. And I said, and I'd have to pay a fee each time, yeah. And I said, and you could deny it or pass it, yeah. Okay, so I said, well, sounds risky. So let me go see what I can do in the county. So we went to the planning department, and that was a really nice gentleman there. And he said, well, you can uh, stay in the county, and you can, you know, use our services, and which are much more limited. And the property right now is a log cabin with a well and a septic tank. <coughs> um, but uh, you're going to need to, uh, you know, if you want to, sell off this this one piece or have your at that time we wanted to see if our one of our kids would like to build a house there and you can see the little piece up here in the corner and it would have this access out to brady road and there's 50 feet over here for another access over to champlain <clears throat> so uh he, he helped us with the forms and not that i need a lot of help because i've got some experience but uh, helped us with the forms and we filed the application to have two houses on the two plus acres. So we went to the initial hearing then at the Magnolia Center because we were having a problem with the pandemic. And um, I went and walked in there and I didn't see a lot going on, but there was a lot of people sitting there. And I thought, wow, boy, I hope they're not here for my case. <laughs> and they all were. And uh, turned out that there's a lot of them, but from my experience in Dunedin, there's always a lot of objectors in Dunedin, no matter what. I mean, they just come from everywhere and line up to speak. So is that of you? they um, basically, some of them wanted um, speed bumps on Brady Road. Some of them didn't want another house in Pinellas <coughs> County because it's too crowded. And the zoning that I was applying for would allow five houses and uh, I didn't realize that, but we only wanted to. So anyway, when we, uh, they all objected and uh, that was just a preliminary hearing. So we all walked outside and I grabbed everybody and said, hey, I think we can sort all this out. You know, some people complained about drainage, I forgot that. 
I think we could sort this out. Why don't we get all together and have a meeting? And I'll, you know, we can have coffee and donuts, and we'll figure out what your problems are, and I'll try and solve them. Because um, that's pretty much what I do for a living. I'm a real estate lawyer. So um, one of the people that was one of the key people in the uh, meeting agreed to set up a meeting, and we would uh, get everybody's emails, and uh, we'd all sit down and talk about the problems. Never heard from anybody again. That was the end of that. So we went to the second meeting, uh, again at the Magnolia Center, and this one had planners there and, you know, people that understood uh, development and all the issues, a lot of county people. And we talked through the, the whole thing, and uh, now it's a smaller group of objectors because the speed bump people and the, you know, no more construction in Pinellas County were all gone. And now it's down to the serious stuff of, you know, uh, how is it going to work? And there are some people who were complaining about the drainage. <clears throat> so at that hearing, um, one of the planners suggested, well, you could limit, you know, you could get rid of the um, concern about the five units by agreeing to the overlay, and you could just have the two units then. And so we, we agreed to that. Um, we amended our uh, uh, application and went back, started over, and went back to the first hearing again and had the first hearing. And the, uh, pretty much now the complainers were the people that uh, are, are honestly suffering some drainage problems. So we um, moved on from that hearing again to the next hearing with some professionals there, and they approved it and moved it on to the LPA, which we had recently. And that, that hearing, uh, there was only uh, four members there, that time instead of seven, I think. And they voted three to one in favor of it. And uh, so I guess that's the last hearing before now. So the last couple of hearings have been uh, approving this. Um, so here I am today, here we are. So this is the, uh, this is the property where the drainage issue is here. And this is a low piece of property. And I don't know how it became, a, a, you know, obviously somebody has dug out the property. I don't, I don't know which prior owner ever did it. Uh, but up here, it's pretty much flat and um, seems to be okay for not having a, you know, a lot of uh, grade that's going to cause a drainage problem. But in any event, I, um, since I wanted to try to figure out what happened and what was the issue, I called up... Uh, Dunedin and they sent out the head guy for engineering and the head guy for drainage and they were, they were very gracious and we walked the whole site and we walked down here and they explained to me that this had all drained historically <coughs> until like the last house which would be this house right here was built and this gentleman raised up the um, property substantially and I think he maybe dug out some of this property that I have because all the trees on it are very young. So, you know, it looks like uh, they haven't been there a long time. And I think he used quite of the dirt, you know, a lot of the dirt to raise up the property. And uh, let me show you what's... So this is that property back there. <clears throat> That's a Labrador going west <laughs> um, and the very back of the property when they raised it up they built a wall so after they built the wall after they you know raised this property up and built this wall they basically reoriented the drainage for the whole area um, and the Dunedin officials told me that um, that was a mistake on Dunedin's part and I asked them, well, how can we fix it? Can, I, um, can we put a pipe in here and drain it? And he said, no. That property to the west has been raised up so high that if we put a pipe in, the water won't go out because water doesn't run uphill. So I said, well, okay, well, what if we um, put a pump on it and uh, get some electricity to it and do it right? And they said, well, we don't want any part of that because... Dunedin doesn't want to maintain a problem that, uh, you know, on county property. And we, we don't want to maintain a pump, and we don't, we don't want the responsibility. Again, very gracious people. They weren't being rude or anything. They just explained it. They didn't want to be involved in that. So we walked around the property, 
with, uh, with me. And um, back to this picture. They indicated that this could easily be graded up here to drain toward this access over here with a swale. And they said, if you, if you grade that and do that, first of all, you'll have no problem attenuating the additional drainage that's going to be created. And if, you can, uh, if you'll be willing to do that, we'll help you. And when the you know, water comes down towards the sidewalk, we'll help you sort it out so that water can actually get out if there is any. So I said, okay, fine. So back to, uh, back to this then. The... Um, this is, I don't know if you can sense it here or not, but this is rising up to that wall. And, the, you know, the wall ends down at the corner, and then it's lower here. So what happens is this drainage, I'll call it a pond, it's a dry pond. <clears throat> when it fills up with water, it um, can only accept so much water because it's accepting water. from this entire area. And on this picture, uh, the house is, my existing house is right here. And you can see that the contours are coming down here. And that means it's steep. And then over here, where I want to build the other house, it's relatively flat. This odd looking thing here is a city drainage dry pond. that's about 81 feet wide by 120 feet long. And I don't know if I can access that or not. But the, uh, the access way to, um, that I was showing you before goes right through here. <clears throat> the, let's see if I can show you how this one. The three people that are having trouble are these three locations here. This gentleman has a really large lot here and this is his uh, garage where he's storing his car collection. And I've heard him explain to, at these meetings that what's happening is water's getting in his garage and it's causing corrosion to his car collection. This lady here is uh, right on the other side of that wall. And this lady over here is the lowest spot. So when the, uh, when the pond fills up, it's got to go someplace because it's been dammed up over here, so it's got to flow through here and out, out there. Um, my solution that um, I would like to propose to these people is that we build some kind of system here, you know, a concrete box with a pipe coming out and a sump pump and some electricity and a easement to get through here, and we just pump the water out here. And it can be automatic or whatever, but Again, I haven't been able to get a meeting with these people, and they've all kind of indicated that they're not in, interested in spending any money, even though um, they're getting flooded. Um, one, one additional thing. When these two houses here were built, um, which are right uphill from this gentleman here, that added to it substantially. And right now, as we're speaking, this house here, um, has pretty much paved this whole situation back here. So he's basically taken a lot of his uh, pervious surface out and it's gonna be substantially worse the next time those big rains come. And this, this thing only fills up when there's really serious rains. I mean, talking about rains for days and days and days. And that happened, didn't, it, it was dry pond when I bought the property, but it happened once since we've been there. It takes a long time after it fills up to, to go away because it, the place is pretty much saturated. But when that is saturated and filled up, it's just like everything else in Pinellas County that we're now trying to struggle with um, because you know you got the new drainage things you're trying to work with and everything. And every other pond in the county is the same way. But we're talking about serious rain. And this, this, this is a ridge right along here. So we're not just talking, you know, it's, it, it's, this whole thing is going down. So let me just, show you this one. Same thing. My spot up here is this pretty much flat spot and this is the um, dry pond that the city has and it has positive outfall and I think it's draining this area or something. Um, again I'm kind of a flat area but then you can see this coming down. This is those two new houses that you know I say new they're the last houses built in the area. They're right above this whole thing right here. 
and uh, they're good size houses, and they're they're direct on this gentleman's property. And this, as I mentioned, this one's getting worse right now. And it looks like it's all being done without a permit or anything. So it's it's going to happen. But you can see once all this water, this this pond down here now, this it, which is not an engineered pond, it was just created by the home builder over here, um, is right here. And it's at the lowest area with that guy. And you can see that where the drainage was going um, until this guy blocked it up. And now I can't go that way anymore. But that's, that's not new. This must have happened, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago or something. But it's been a drainage problem ever since. So I'm not... I'm not trying to uh, be a development. I'm trying to do a lot split. I've got two plus acres, and um, you can see that uh, some of the people who are objecting don't want this to be like this, and I'm I'm in favor of that. I just want to, you know, it, 1957 it looked like this, and I think uh, our section of it is this piece right here. And you can see it was always draining down to the area where the vegetation is, but that got blocked off, so it had to go someplace. So I've got plenty of land, and uh, we'd like to, you know, have another lot out of it. And uh, as uh, Randy Ayers mentioned, we plan to attenuate whatever additional drainage this construction creates, and that's your ordinance anyway. We have to do that. It's the law. So... I don't think we're asking for a lot, and I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thorough. Appreciate it. All right. Um, and we have now Jody Jansen. Is there Jody Jansen here? No? She's going to pass for now. Oh, she's going to pass. Okay. <coughs> How about Penny High Duke? Okay. Sorry for the oh, no problem. mess with your last name. No one gets it right. <laughs> How do you say it? It's High Duke. Exactly Hi Duke. the way it is isn't spelled. Hi Duke. Okay. <coughs> nice to meet you, Penny. Nice Welcome. to meet you, too. Thanks for Please your time today. Please give your address. Uh, yeah, Penny High Duke, uh, 1541 Brady. Um, we've owned the house uh, since uh, March of last year. Uh, we also own a second property uh, over at Bayshore Boulevard, so we have two properties in Pinellas and in Dunedin, and uh, are in the process of moving here from Chicago. So uh, I also have a history going back to my childhood. I've always had family in, the, in this area, so this has uh, pretty much always been a second home. Uh, so just a couple of things I wanted to uh, just sort of get on record and be really clear on. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you'd seen some things that have been on the file and going on since the January meeting. Uh, there is, uh, there are several owners here. There's also a kind of petition and just a statement letter in the file that's been signed by 13 homeowners. There's a lot more than three homes or properties that are affected um, by current issues and issues that will be exacerbated by uh, construction and new development on this property without proper drainage um, being uh, considered with that. Um, you know, the other thing that I, I would state, and I think many of us would state, is we understand a separation between city and county. Um, at the same time, we are city. This property is not an island. It is attached to city properties. We all pay our taxes to the county and the city, so really we, we want to see a little more kind of cooperation um, as you said, Commissioner Flowers, earlier to Innisbrook, you know, put yourselves in the shoes uh, of your neighbors and those of us who, you know, my house has been there since 1973. So uh, it, it's been a vital part um, of, of this area of Dunedin, and I think it deserves, as all my other neighbors do, the same consideration and the quality of life in that home. Um, both the city and county engineers have stated that there are current issues, and Mr. Kimpton talked about it, and we are talking to the city about things that have happened with other developments. Um, and so I would underscore that you'd understand that that makes us uh, really concerned to ensure that these things are actually followed through on, um, because everyone is supposed to be protecting from any new um, any new water concerns. Again, my home's been there since 1973. My neighbors lived next door to me for 27 years. The water issues have just started in the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, we can really kind of speak to that historically. 
Um, the other thing too, with time running short, I do want to go on record, not to be a he said, she said, but I wanted to be clear when Mr. Kimpton states that he wants to work with a neighborhood, that there has been no effort that I'm aware of since January to work with any of us. I called Mr. Kimpton personally, myself, on February 15th to introduce myself, to discuss the issues, and I asked him what his plans were for getting together with the neighbors. Um, and he told me that he thought I should coordinate that or some of us should coordinate that. So I guess that's time out. That's okay. I wanted to get those in front of you. And again, appreciate you and your time. Thank you. Neil Kirschman. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Neil Kirschman. I live at 1640 Brady Drive. And uh, I, I guess uh, first thing that I'd like to just make sure, I know we've had several communications with the city of Dunedin, and I know the commissioners uh, had stated that they sent a letter originally of a request to the, pl to the planning board to uh, delay, in fact, some of this meeting. And I wanted to make sure that you folks have had an opportunity to review the letter from the uh, city commissioners. Uh, raising, you know, their, cons their concerns. And I think the biggest, con you know, that we have within the neighborhood is that, you know, we know that you have a process, but from our perspective, it's like, you know, put the cart before the horse. We know there are drainage issues. You know, why don't we have a plan to resolve the drainage issues before we make the zoning change? We know for things that, in fact, I know that, you know, from the letter that's been going around, the county and the city have been working on like sewage, sewer system things. I know the, the property right now is strictly on septic in order to attach to, the, to any sewer lines. They'd have to attach to the city that, you know, but I understand the county and the city are working on something to resolve. You know, those kinds of things, I would hope that the two organizations would be able to have some conclusion on I know, you know, or like the applicant has also talked about, well, gee, we could drain to this other area type of thing. Well, shouldn't that be worked before we get approval to put more concrete down, which is going to make only exacerbate the situation and make any drainage, you know, even worse than it, than it is today? He also talked about the dry bed, by the way, that's owned by a private, prop, by a pri private person. Uh, you know, owner, it's not owned by the city of Dunedin. So get, attaching to a dry, to the dry bed that he referenced, in fact, it's not city land. Uh, you know, it's owned by, by a private person. So, uh, you know, again, I, I think I've just basically, you know, come to the point of, you know, I would wish that you would, you know, take to the concerns, look to the, between the county and the city to work something prior to um, again, I live right across from where that narrow tip is on the applicant's property. My concern is if, if he were allowed to have any water flow out from that small tip out on a Brady Drive, which is used by emergency vehicles all the time in the city of Dunedin to go up and down Brady Drive, putting any more water rush during any rain flow you know, onto that street would be hazardous. And I think it should be taken into consideration before any of that would be done. So, again, work the issue first is my only thing. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Ms. Uh, John Davis. Good evening. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, my name is John Davis, 1630 Brady Drive in Dunedin. Uh, my, my concerns are, are pretty much like Neil's. The, the problem, uh, I, I've seen flooding at Penny's house before she was living there where the, the entire property is underwater. And when it's all done and over, there's sand and dirt in the street that the city has to come out and literally shovel out. and. I think before anything should happen, the city and the county should work out the water situation because putting 
all these dwellings is just going to, you know, it's, it's all downhill. And I'm not an engineer or anything, but it's going to be a real, real problem for those people at the bottom of that hill. They're, it's a mess. It really is. And, and one or two individuals just don't have the financial ability to, it's just going to put it on another house. You know, you, maybe you could move it away from your house with a wall and someone else is going to have to deal with it. And that's about all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Debbie Davis. Hi. Good Debbie evening. Davis. I'm at 1630. Um, John's my husband. Basically, what these guys have said is my thoughts on it, too, is it needs to be, the, you know, the drainage issues need to be resolved before this is approved. Um, because it's not just moving a house and putting it here and another house down here. Uh, Mr. Kempton hasn't even lived here through really bad rains yet either. Um, what he, he makes it sound kind of flippantly like, oh yeah, some water fills up in there and it takes a long time, but we haven't had any huge, you know, rainfall like Florida hits, you know. So, and he hasn't seen those effects. Um, we have lived to where, on Brady, where we can't even drive our car down that street. We have to go up to, Kurt, or to um, <coughs> CR1 and around because there's so much water drainage down there. So there is a, a significant issue that needs to be resolved first. And putting in just a house up here, you know, that's still not just a house. He can still have, you know, a, an ADU. He can have under uh, a garage per each one of those two houses. So, you know, it's lots of buildings that could be put on there and a lot of grading and, you know, there's already major issues. So I'm hoping you guys will reconsider just postponing this or not approving it until something is done with the drainage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so, Glenn, do you have any comments with regard to some of the concerns that have been raised? I was <clears throat> curious where this is. This is in our well, that, correspondence. That's really a good picture. Yes. Yeah. Maybe Glenn knows. <clears throat> I think that's the trap. Oops, sorry. Looks like the drop. This was sent to us, and I'm trying. Maybe one somebody can identify where this is. Okay, thank you. Yes. Right. <clears throat> I mean, most of the uh, concerns now are the drainage related things, which is not really a, a zoning item that you look at for a zoning change. It's handled after the zoning change during the permitting process. So it's not a criteria for a rezone. Um, so it's just not something so in the code. So we're not there yet, similar we're to what uh, Commissioner. Peters well, you look at in a rezone's compatibility <coughs> with the lot sizes, things like that. You look at in the path to density, things like that. It's not a, drainage is not one, not a certain thing you look at for a rezone. So it's, it comes okay. after. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the beginning of a process that will take a while before we go through all the various steps, and they'll come back to us, right? If you approve this rezone, then all that stuff afterwards will be handled by staff. It'll be handled by the staff. Like but Mr. Then Ayers. At the point where Mr. Uh, Kempton would draw a permit, wouldn't we be having conversations then? No. No, that doesn't come back to the commission. Uh, that's handled at the staff level. Okay. Well, it's all handled at the staff level. Correct. Yes, based on the codes. So, Commissioner Fla uh, Peters. Well, so we have no authority to mandate Dunedin do something with the drainage um, because that's all city and we don't have the authority to mandate that. Um, and clearly based on the flow lines, if those flow lines are accurate, which I don't know if our staff agrees that those flow lines are accurate, it appears from the flow lines that were shown on the pictures that there's significant water flow coming way, uh, you know, not even within those those homes right there, right? So it seems that um, the the drainage problem is a is a right. So right. it's all going. I'm not sure if it's upside down to you or not. Uh, this is west. <clears throat> it's all going to the west. But it's all going to the west for several blocks, right? Uh, well, he said this is kind. Of, this is kind of the flat area. So somewhere in here, I, I don't know what it looks like beyond that, but. Uh, but most that, of this is eventually going to get out to the roads, Brady, right. or whatever this is down there. But that kind of the center of the picture where the four arrows are pointing, 
um, that significant flow, and it's and it's coming from not just the neighbors, but even across that street, whatever street that is. So, um, well, it looks like um, you know, kind of above that number forty-five, it seems to be coming <coughs> in that direction. Is that correct? So the street go past those homes. It seems to be fl coming from that in front of those homes. So it's coming from the street of those homes and, and flowing that way? Which, these homes? Yeah. These homes, typically the lot grading would be out to the street. And the same with these, the lot grading would be out towards the street. street. So you're basically looking at a swath through the middle that is draining to the west. <clears throat> and the city of Dunedin has said they have no interest in maintaining anything that would fix this. I don't know. OK. Read your letter from the city. So, okay. So, like, but the issue for the county, the reason we can't do anything is all those lots are in the city, in the and city. these are city streets. So we don't have access to their uh, right. drainage system. But in the county, he would have to, through the permitting process, ensure that the, draining is the drainage is appropriate for that land, correct? Right. 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 So, so, um, so he would have to do the due diligence to ensure that the drainage on that property is appropriate. Yes. Okay. Do we have anything? Commissioner Raggers? <clears throat> yeah, well, it seems to me from just listening to folks that it is reasonable request to add a house. Just reasonable based on the amount of land they have there, yeah. based on um, the, the lot sizes around. I'm not even sure that the folks that were here tonight disagree with that. I'm not going to put words in their mouth. But the issue is, is that this is a bigger problem than just this property right. so the folks that are asking for the help they're, they're wanting to add the house are part of a maybe bigger problem that um, has been kind of I don't know put off um, I don't know if the city of Dunedin has put it off or they say hey we've got this county property here and lots of land and we'll just let it let it happen for a while and now somebody wants to build on it and everybody legitimately has concerns about like, you know, I think somebody said the cart before the horse. Like, let's fix the problem so that everybody has confidence that we've got a solution here. And I think that's reasonable. Um, it seems like with, with Mr. Kempton's request, we have an opportunity to get this thing right. Now, I'm not sure what this is, okay? So I'm not, I, I went to engineering school, but my, my buddies in engineering school said, please never design anything. Uh, bridges or anything, <laughs> but I, but I, you know, I, but my point really is that we do have a chance to fix this problem, and it's not just this property is not causing the problem. This incremental piece that they're going to add will be taken care of, maybe, maybe it'll add to the already bigger problem that's there. Um, so I think it's fair to ask for the address. It's fair for you all to get a problem taken care of, and we're not going to do it alone. The county can't do it alone. The city has to be at the table to take care of this problem. So I guess I, my question to either Glenn or to Mr. Ayers is, why are we not having a conversation with the city to take care of this problem? And I'm not saying us take care of it, but all of us work together to get a solution there. This pro if, you get, if you watch the greater picture here, it does flow, even continues to flow to the west. There's a, there's a piece of a golf course down there, the, uh, and, and it kind of goes down that way. So there's a you know, natural flow in the, within those, I think somebody said these properties flow t to the streets, but in this middle area here, they naturally flow west and maybe just a hair to the north, but it's gonna flow that way down that street, and we've gotta figure out a way to get from point A to point B, some of this water flow. And so it's reasonable, again, for you all to have the concern addressed by the city, by the county, and it's reasonable to have a home, a second home built on a piece of property that's over two acres. It's small, the lots are, lots are going to be smaller than the properties around there for the most part, not all of them. So um, I, I just don't know how we get this problem solved without the city being mm -hmm. at the table. And, um, and so they requested us to work with them. So what's that issue? Where is that in all of this? They so, requested something. So the city, no, the city did ask for a delay. So the commission, right. they asked the commission to delay this so they could meet with the property owner. We talked to the property owner, and he requested that the, this meeting be held. And he has that right 
to ask for you to hear the case. So can I ask a question about your about your yeah. question? Because I, having been involved in these issues in another chapter of my life, I am curious. Usually, this kind of an issue, as it relates to drainage and or the infrastructure under the ground, is taken care of by the governing body, isn't it? Usually. Well, it, except just, when you have a border issue like this. Oh yeah, but <laughs> forget about that for the moment. But for the purposes of my question. Sure. I'm right about that, right? Yes. So my my thought or question is, Mr. Kempton, just make believe for a minute that you were annexed into the city of Dunedin. Would the city of Dunedin then fix the issues with regard to the drainage? Madam Chair, know? according to their letter from Dunedin, that mm -hmm. is in our pack, pack, blah, blah, that is in our packet. It says. This is from Bruce from the city of Dunedin. Um, he says, the subject property is unincorporated and the properties along Nigel are city of Dunedin. We looked at potentially constructing a storm pipe outfall at the discharge point to our Nigel storm drain, but the elevations did not make it work. So they're saying that they saw a potential solution, but because of the elevations, which we saw in the pictures where you it's kind of low lying and it looks like it elev it goes up a little bit. They're saying they didn't make it work. And so because of that, they're not willing to, that's what this letter says. Because uh, of that, okay. they're not willing to do it. All right, just let us, let us finish chatting for a minute. Um, so Mr. Kempton, my question to you is, given that the city asked for a delay why was it that you wanted to come here anyway without them having an opportunity to do whatever it was they were going to do? What uh, has apparently happened from what I see is that, um, first of all, as I mentioned, I already had the head of the drainage department and the head of the en or an engineering department that relates to drainage. So I had the two people <coughs> from Dunedin who, as I said, were very gracious and very helpful. And spent uh, like a couple hours with me walking around the site and trying to talk about the whole thing. And they told me that they have gone over to these homes on Nigel and tried to regrade them so that uh, they could make it work better. And that didn't work. And uh, I, I talked to them about the pipe. And I said, just as uh, Commissioner here mentioned, um, they said, that's not going to work. And I said, well, you know, let's try something more elaborate. And they said, we don't have any part of that. We're not going to agree to that. Um, so ever since then, I've been thinking, well, let's get together with the neighbors and get an engineer out here and figure out what needs to be done. And um, maybe it costs $5,000 for the three houses that are involved. And I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay 40 percent of it. You know, I'll help. I'll, I want to do it. I'll, I'll give the easement. I'll, I'll, whatever needs to be done. But as you know, I mentioned, I've tried to get together with these people. They don't want to meet. They don't want to contribute. They just want somebody else to take care of it. And Dunedin has made it clear they're not going to take care of it. Now, some of these people have gone to the political people in Dunedin and said, oh, bad problem over here, and you need to get involved. But it's not the people from drainage or engineering. So I don't think anything's ever going to happen there. Now, however, in the county, we have a drainage tax that raises lots of money. So if the county wants to get involved, that would be great. You know, let's take some of that drainage money and I'll give an easement. I'll, I'll give some property. I'll help. Um, it's, it's Dunedin that created this problem because they gave a permit for a home that should have never been built where there was positive outfall and the whole thing drained and they allowed it to be dammed up. So uh, it came out at the LPA hearing. Somebody asked, one of the commissioners asked, if Kimpton's house wasn't even there, the existing structures weren't there, we just took it away, forget building the second one, and these torrential storms come in, what's going to happen? And they said, exact same thing. It's going to flood, it's going to fill up, the water's got to go someplace, it's going to go to the new direction to the, um, would be the northwest, and it's going to get uh, Penny's house, and it's going to get the other lady's house, and it's going to get the guy's, the guy, the, this garage, is at ground zero. He's at the bottom of the whole thing. So it, this is a ridge over here on uh, County Road 1, and this, this whole ridge is draining towards the Gulf. I think it, 
I think it's Curlew Creek it, it adds into and uh, goes all the way down there. It's, it's, not, uh, it's only when the big rains happen, you know, normal rains happen, you can walk down there in the morning and it's almost bone dry. You can, you're not getting, even going to get your shoes muddy because this is all sand and it drains really good. But sooner or later, when you get, you know, I think when we, uh, we saw this thing fill up, it had rained for weeks, you know, it was a, one of those things that didn't stop. And uh, that when that happens, Pinellas County is essentially flat. I mean, all this water is trying to get to the Gulf. And unfortunately, Dunedin allowed it to get dammed up, so now it's a problem. And uh, the one lady said it's only been a problem for two years. That's, that's incorrect. This has been going on for a long time. All right, thank you. You bet. So um, can our staff continue to try to work with Dunedin and figure something out? There's got to be some solution mm -hmm. somehow, even if, even if there's an assessment. Well, so from, from, a, from a standpoint of a drainage issue, they, can, they, should, they could and should try to work with them regardless of what the outcome of this. You have an issue there. The, the issue um, is kind of a separate issue from the development itself. I mean, now, whether you want to take action on this now, postpone it, well, that's up to the commission. Um, but we can get them involved. But, but it's, it's, really, it's really mostly the drainage issues are mostly within the city, and except for this particular part of the property. So, well, we have a former mayor here who has good relationships with those folks. I, and I did hear uh, our staff say that we're not supposed to be considering drainage here right. and this issue tonight. So let's go ahead and take action if it's the will of the board, <coughs> excuse me, on this issue. And then let's proceed with our staff talking to the Dunedin staff and Commissioner Eggers. Maybe you can... Mm -hmm help move that along a little bit. How about that? So I had a question for the engineer. Mr. Ayers? Yeah, again, um, this just is, can't be that complicated. Um, we have a pond mm -hmm. that can be made bigger. True. Sure. Can be so, made bigger, and you can have a, an outfall so that it, when it gets to a certain height, it flows out of a pipe. It shows that these height, the height of the property is still going down. Now the drainage pond probably gotten underneath, but you can, it can, it can move. You can. I don't know if there's any easement areas between the homes. No, there I, are. There's so it's just property to property. So right. there's no, there's no way to get anything out. Right. So if the county, if DRS engineering was doing a project like this, we would ensure that there were easements to maintain the flow through it. So, so there's no easements on any of those down no. there. The mm -hmm. pond was never an engineered pond. So I understand. That's true. So it's, it's already, Mr. Kempton's property is already retaining more volume or some of the volume that's, that's running off. And so when he develops, say he builds another house, say that increases, that increases the discharge by 20%, yeah. we're going to make him retain 20% that 20% his increase incremental on his increase property. he's going to have to retain. Yes. But the rest of the problem that's there, Existing. whether his homes are there or not, right. Right. is not all his responsibility. No. It's, it's a bigger issue. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Flowers. Um, for the email um, from Bruce from Dunedin, so I assume he's in one of their permitting or zoning departments or whatever. He's their drainage guy. He's their he's drainage guy. Yeah, okay. Okay. He used to work to, for Swift Mud. Okay. So uh, going down no. to the last um, few sentences, he does allude to no e easements exist from the property to either Nigel's or Brady. <clears throat> and even if they did, again, the existing drainage systems on those streets don't provide for a pipe solution. Any development, fill or impervious surface to the vacant parcel, which is um, the gentleman here, will increase flooding to city and county properties. Having said all of this, I've not seen the zoning request under consideration by the county, so I don't know what is actually being requested. So unfortunately, it seems like property was purchased that had goo gobs of problems before he got it. Now that he has it, he's trying to figure something out. I don't know if we have the ability to, you know, if an uh, option could be that we make a motion to defer this. 
for this evening mm -hmm. because I, we're not being asked to make a judgment on the, the zone. I mean, the flooding. We're here to talk about the zoning. So for the zoning, he's well within his rights and what our requirements are to grant him the zoning, yeah. which has nothing to do with the flooding issue. That's a separate issue. But um, as it stands right now, it's like he's not going to be able to do anything on the property anyway because he's going to be flooded. <laughs> no mm -hmm. matter what he does, mm -hmm. he's going to be flooded. So I don't know how you all feel, but I would seek to, just based on reading these emails, I would seek to defer this item and, and let staff hopefully try to figure something out between the county and the city because it's not this gentleman's fault that he has unfortunately purchased property that has all of these issues. If you look at some of the photos that are here, mm -hmm. um, going, um, you can see the wall that he's talking about that the people built. And as a result of building that wall and then there's a landing, then a drop off. Mm -hmm. So that's not helping either because that water is off just kind of filling up right there. I hate to think about the mosquito issue or whatever, depending on how long, and the stagnation for how long that water sits there. Um, so, and, and I, I don't want to be unfair to him because, again, he purchased property that he just wants to add two additional homes to. Which he one has the right to do. Which he has the right to do. One, one yes. additional home. One additional home, I'm sorry. It's, it's the cabin mm -hmm. home is there plus the home. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said. I don't know what his plans are. He may tear one house down, but he well, he just said he's gonna build something for his son. So, um, well, but but either way, either way, what he's asking for tonight is permissible. Yep. Mm -hmm. However, he's still gonna have issues because of the flooding. But that's a separate that's issue. A separate separate issue. issue. And right now, we have this in front of us. So, can we take care? Yes, Commissioner. So, uh, my question is, you know, and I don't support deferring it, and this is why. And I guess if you can answer this question, then maybe I would. Um, what are we deferring it for? That's my because Dun Eden has already kind of made their comments, and I don't understand what we're deferring it for. This this clearly is a problem with Dun Eden. Uh, not necessarily with the county, although it touches the county because it goes over on to his property. Um, and if the county is going to ensure that he has to assume that 20%, then the county has done their due diligence to make sure that he's not, you know, um, that he's account accountable for the additional flooding. So I, I, what I don't understand is what do we defer it for? Yeah, I, I, I was making I the suggestion because where he is now, he it is in what's considered unincorporated, which is county, correct? Right. His lot is unincorporated. Right. Everything around him is, is city of Dunedin. Dunedin. And so he's trapped. And, and mm -hmm. again, it's, you know how sometimes we talk about all of these small little pockets where maybe something, someone came in, they asked for something, we granted it or city granted it, and they left off this little piece. Well, his little piece has been left off of being annexed maybe prior to by the city of Dunedin. So I just, the reason why I was asking for that was because it's of no fault of his that he's in that little piece, unfortunately, right. that is unincorporated. So I would not support deferment because- you don't, Yeah, you don't have to, I just want to- you know, That's yeah. what I'm just saying. I agree yes. with well, Commissioner Peters and I'd like to hear from David. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, I think we have to light a fire on mm -hmm. the city's doorstep to make this is this is a problem for residents in Dunedin correct and so deferring it serves no purpose I think by by passing what is legitimately a legitimate request makes total sense but I still think there's a big problem here I and if they don't take care of that problem if the city doesn't do what they're supposed to be doing then you guys are going to have the problem you have and a little bit more. I don't think the incremental piece that's going to be added to it is the problem. I think there's a bigger problem that needs to be taken care of. So I, I think deferring it is not the right solution. I think approving it is to, to make sure that the city of Dunedin and the county does work together. And maybe it's the property owners, the two property owners that can provide access and you know they say, well we don't have any we don't have any solutions on Nigel's. Well Make work on some things there to help the residents in that area to convey water. I mean that's that's the basic responsibility of the city, and they know it. And I think okay. they need to be a part of the but, solution. But the 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 other piece, and then I'll recognize Commissioner Seal. Uh, I heard Mr. Kempton say he was very anxious to try and meet with the neighbors and work on a solution. The neighbors don't want to meet with Mr. Kempton. 
But I'm telling you, there is strength in numbers, and if you work together, that's how you're going to get food to the people in the in the public in the city hall in Dunedin. Commissioner Seal. And <clears throat> that is probably a very valid point. I guess I want to state the fact that. <clears throat> we do have, we are a body that has the ability to decide on the zoning. That's why it's here today. It's not a given. It is considering the facts and considering all of the um, aspects of the case. <clears throat> so my biggest fear is, is that if we allow an additional unit on this property and they go through and find out that they need a lot more land for drainage, We've just created another situation where we say you can build two houses here, but there's no room to handle the drainage, or there's no easements, as was stated by our county staff. So that is my fear, is that we are going to be, um, and I'm not adverse to finding solutions, let me state that, but I, I kind of, I agree with Commissioner Flowers that Maybe by deferring it, we force the city and the county and the neighbors and everybody to work together to make sure there is a conceivable solution here. Um, I'll go back to, in history. I've walked um, the creeks of Curlew Creek with Bruce Worth when he was with Swift Mutt. And we allowed, in the, in the unincorporated and in the city of Dunedin, to allow people to build on creeks. They built close to the creeks, and then they started flooding. And so guess what? You know, county and city allowed structures to be built, and then we suddenly had to deal with the consequences because we hadn't planned for adequate drainage and adequate, you know, creeks rising and falling and whatever. And I'll never forget that. I mean, you know, we looked for solutions for Curlew Creek for years. So I'm all, I'm not, it's hard to equate that with this, but I'm using that as an example of, you know, be careful what you create because you may not really solve the problem. Well, I hear you, Commissioner Seal, but there's something about the way the, this is evolving that troubles me because it makes me feel like the city of Dunedin is holding Mr. Kempton hostage because he's in an enclave. Mm -hmm. Well, that's his choice if that's what he wants. But then he has to. But then he has to continue to be on septic. Yes. Which is not something which is that not we, what we want either. And, yeah, you know, you've got to have. It, it, there's got to be some kind of. There does. Conducive solution here. And, and not too long ago, there was an actual. Remember, the state said anything under an acre was going to be automatically annexed. You know, they were trying to get rid of the little on. Right, we did This that. is a little bigger than mm -hmm. an acre, so it probably avoided that mm -hmm. um, but I do think we've had time I mean we've had time and I think the city is I mean and again you know, I probably won't get into those doors when I make these comments but I think they're <laughs> stalling <laughs> and and they're and they are holding I think a little bit um, you know uh, Mr. Kempton's foot to the feet to the fire and I, I think this this by by not deferring it by approving the use which is really our responsibility here from a zoning standpoint, I mean, I would ask our county attorney, but I mean, w we have a responsibility to look at the zoning request. And the zoning request to me, it's, it's kind of like, well, this is, these are gonna be bigger, bigger pieces of land. There's gonna be a lot more impervious area based on the property size and then, then, then that's in the area. So uh, wh why, are we, why would we be denying it for that purpose? To me, um, there is a bigger problem here, and it needs to be taken care of. Um, and I, but I don't, I don't think I think it's unfair to not uh, to to defer this. I think we should go ahead and pass it tonight. That's our responsibility. That's the zoning request, and then it gets bit, bit, put back on our staff to think out of the box, along with the city of Dunedin, to come up with a with a bigger, a better solution. I think the, the question, you know, if those houses weren't there, honestly, if those houses weren't there, the problem still exists. And the house, one house is there and the problem exists. Two houses are there, the problem will exist. And it, it, it would be incrementally more in each of those steps, but it's still going to be a problem. So I think we have a responsibility to the requester tonight to, to do it and then put, to put it in the hands of engineers.
to take care of the problem. So, okay, right. so this has been a good discussion with a lot of thoughtful comments made, and I would like to ask for a motion and a second, please, to, to move this forward. I would move to approve it. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please open the board and let us and let us vote. I'm not opening. I'm a no. Okay, and so it passes three to two, right? Yep. Help me out with my eyesight here. Yes, it. Okay, thank you ever so much. And uh, since this is the last item that we have to deal with tonight, I would like to recognize our county attorney, Jewel White, for just a moment. Go ahead, Jewel. Yes, I will not uh, belabor this. I know that this has been a long evening, but I wanted to, uh, against his will, recognize David <clears throat> Sadowski, who is here for his last meeting with the county commission as he will be retiring next month oh. after 33 years of service. Now, David, come on up here and just say one or two things, please. I know you're shy, but... David has spent 33 years with Pinellas County. He spent a couple with another county in Florida. <laughs> so he has just... Well, he is preparing to complete his drop period and hopefully uh, right off into a very happy sunset with his lovely wife. There you go. Congratulations. Congratulations. So you may ask what I want to do. Well, I was going to do that, but I didn't so, want to probe if you so weren't. So I'll be, I'll be really brief. I would like to become a grandparent. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> so it's not under my control, but, uh, you know, so, like but uh, hopefully that will be in, in my near future. Well, I, I did want to thank, um, I mean, I've been blessed. I've worked under three excellent county attorneys. Uh, I think you've known all, most of you have known all three of them, and are really a lot of quality workers, employees at uh, Pinellas County. So it's been a, um, it's been a quick, it seems like a quick 33 years. I, I'm really not sure I believe I'm retiring, but I, I really have been blessed and I wanted to thank you for, for everything you've done and Jewel especially for having a great office and really making the experience really well. Thank well, you. I want to wish you great joy and happiness and a fabulous new adventure. And most of all, be healthy. Thank you. I just wanted to add one other thing. Yeah. So when I first started working for the county, Ronald Reagan was the Oh my goodness. Oh my. Minister. So just uh, 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 if you figure out how to get that that wish of having grandkids uh, accomplished, <laughs> let me know. So maybe you know do that. <laughs> so. good luck to you and enjoy your next phase of your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your service. Very grateful. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, then we are adjourned. Thank you for a great meeting. Yes, ma'am.